importance of this topic this uh, so this basically this uh, program is organized to give a hands on training on software defined radio so as you know the software defined radio popularity is growing day by day defense in other applications as well and uh, uh, this because because of the software defined radio now there is a possibility of changing to any radio environment okay you can switch to any radio based on the availability you can explore cognitive radio you can explore how you can adaptively change your modulation scheme how you can adaptively change your uh, communication protocol as well so this is very timely and i would like to congratulate the team for organizing this workshop and uh, here at iit jammu also we are trying hard to develop a center for the especially for software defined radio and related application and we have also developed jointly with dr amit kumar singh we have developed uh, fmcw radar as well with the help of software defined radio and i would definitely say that all the participants are going to learn a lot throughout this course and they will learn the open source software and also some of the proprietary software like uh, lab view to deal with the software defined radio and uh, again once again i would like to welcome all the participants and i would like to say that you are definitely going to take a lot of thing from this workshop so uh, congratulations to all the team and welcome to the participant now i would like to uh, uh, ask dr amit kumar singh the main coordinator of this workshop to briefly tell us what is the agenda and how the complete workshop is planned uh, it is over to you sir thank you okay, so uh, thank you ankit sir and suchitra and uh, also first of all i would like to thank all the dignitaries here uh, from entire the globe uh, space I, i will also let you know that uh, the people are from which which countries which which universities which which organizations as of now and also from uh, iit jammu side we have uh, professor pk vijayan the dean rnc and uh, professor singh uh, the dean continuing education we will come to both of you sir just after some time so uh, let me just give a brief about uh, what the workshop is what was the idea behind and how we got the response as of now and how we will continue till next 6 days as the proceedings of this workshop is concerned so uh, we planned this workshop uh, uh, depending on the need of the technology as of now that is a software defined radio and uh, this workshop uh, as ankit sir also told uh, the technology itself is uh, more and more relevant so that the complete communication system almost complete that it either it is satellites either it is millimeter waves either it is personalized communication network for defense either it is for any any uh, uh, personal level application as well so uh, all these kind of uh, communications are going to be on the software defined in the coming generations in the next few days maybe few years so depending on this we planned a complete hands on workshop where the agenda of the workshop is how the participants can get uh, clarity about the software defined radio and how they can start experimenting on them maybe at your home at your own system at your own labs and implementing the ideas on them so idea being that we proposed this workshop and uh, uh, i am very happily saying that our organization that is indian institute of technology jammu and uh, with our department that is department of electrical engineering uh, we are organizing this workshop under the flagship of uh, ieee mtts sbc iit jammu that is uh, ieee's uh, microwave theory technique society student branch chapter and uh, uh, once we started this registration process till now uh, we got about 163 registrations and that to Uh, from as suchitra as well as ankit sir also told from 10 different countries so as of now uh, we got registrations from sri lanka we got registrations from uh, uh, 
followed by that uh, from uh, south korea we got registrations from uh, ohio state university tmr uh, some tm university and also we got registrations from uh, itu international telecommunication unit we get registrations from uh, university of college dublin we have registrations from university of access we have registrations again from caltech and also some of the more uh, there uh, we have registrations from malaysia we have registrations from sri lanka cambodia we have registrations from uh, saudi arabia as well similarly we have registrations from canada ontario and uh, in india we have registrations from uh, our own institution iit jammu followed by that uh, iit patna nit srinagar iisc bangalore few registrations from isro few registrations from drdo nit silchar vnit nagpur and uh, bits pilani hyderabad campus as well as uh, pilani campus and uh, uh, then registrations from again uh, uh, we have from uh, uh, iit chennai iit karakpur iit bhu iit delhi and followed by that we have few more registrations from iit kanpur as well and uh, followed by that several more universities and institutions across the india as well as across the globe okay. so Uh, this just I said that uh, 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 how the relevant technology is and how the interested participants are to learn about, and that is something called the significance of this workshop throughout the world and in terms of the communication technology. So, just giving this briefing now, I will come to the agenda point that uh, what we are going to do in coming six days. so i will just share my screen and i will show you the agenda points so in that case let me share my screen first of all so yeah so my screen so hope my screen is visible to all of you so here is the brief agenda uh, hope my screen is visible sir all of you yeah yes yeah. sir it is oh. Oh. yeah okay so the agenda points starting from day 1 that is uh, we already started from 10 o'clock till 11:30 we have to go for introduction to lab view that is a graphical system first we will learn about some of the theoretical part here as well as we will go on its hands on and that will be controlled by jatin and again from uh, just after 10 or 15 minutes of break we will again start on lab view toolkits there we will work on math script models and modulation toolkits where again we will have to have some of the theoretical part first of all and then followed by that the hands on and that will be again taken by jatin and uh, from 3 pm to 5 pm we will go for usrp hardware architecture and that is one of the most important for this complete workshop and that will be taken care by uh, nilutpal and all all they are from evart systems so uh, in second day from 10 am we will start with uh, usrp iq structures and that to dealing with lab view and ni usrp that will be taken by subham and analog and digital modulation techniques again it will be taken by amal all this will be followed by the critical part as well as the hands on part so uh, from 3 to 5 pm we will go for demodulation of over the air fm signals and will be taken by amal and again uh, the third day from 10 am to 11:30 we will go for siso packet based radio transceivers will be taken by nilutpal and uh, baseband transmitters design uh, we have one table and that two specifications again will be taken by raghavend baseband receiver designs as per uh, uh, our uh, standard protocols here uh, that will be taken by raghavend again on the fourth day we will go to some in to in ofdm system followed by that we will also go for multi user mimo theory as well as its 4g and 5g lt implementation that to critical part as well as some demonstration will be taken by nilutpal again uh, on the same day we will go for physical layer mimo in to in implementation again here we will have a theoretical part as well as demonstration followed by that we will go to gnu radio where uh, that will be taken by snehasis fm uh, rds receiver and transmitter 
OFDM VPSA transmitter that too hands on on uh, and followed by that on sixth day we will go for its radar application and we will have our guest from NIE that is Vinit Vanshal he will take uh, care of this radar part and his uh, teammate uh, uh, Shatya he will be also from Constellar Signals he will also take care of the radar part. So, and following by that from 3 to 5 p.m. on the last day, we will have the research trains that how the research is in terms of the software defined radio. So, uh, as of now, if you have seen, we have three uh, industry partners with us, uh, where I should say in particular three industry experts from MGUR systems, from national instruments and from Constellar signals. And their experts in with our association, they will try to deliver their best from their side. And that is just the overview of the workshop, which we will have in next coming six days. So we tried our best to cover almost all the basic parts to some of the advanced part of the communication system implementation by using the software defined radio. So this is something for workshop related content. Now, again, uh, uh, you know, for formally, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor P.K. Vijayan, the Dean RNC of IIT Jammu, to have a few words with us. So, please, uh, uh, the dais is yours, sir. Vijayan, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit Kumar Singh. And welcome to you all from my side. Uh, as far as I am concerned, Software-defined radio communication is a total stranger to me. But I understand that it is an upcoming innovative mode of communication with tremendous possibilities, not only in civil sector, but also in the military and many other wide range of application possibilities. And no wonder that we have uh, large national and international participations. We have uh, industries, several of them already there. And as explained by Dr. Amit Kumar Singh, you know, it covers a very wide range of, you know, probably covering the entire field of this uh, software defined radio communication. And uh, I must uh, congratulate you know, the organizers for taking up this very interesting field. And uh, as I believe, you know, after this, you will take home some very important inputs which could be useful to you. And, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And welcome to you all once again. Okay, so thank you, Vijan, sir, for your kind words. Now, again, uh, just again for formal innovation, we have uh, our Dean Continuing Education, Professor Rakesh Singhai. So, uh, Singhai, sir, can you have a few words from your side, sir, please? Okay. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Ankit, for inviting me for this inaugural session. <clears throat> Uh, as I, from what I know about, what I have heard from you about software radio, it is related to communication and I think to the 5G things which are coming up across. And <clears throat> what I'm really excited about this conference is that you've made it hands-on. And, uh, you know, because one thing which I think in Indian entire education system, what we lack or what people bemoan is the connect with the industry. And so I would like to really thank these industry experts who are there. And I hope they're able to deliver you know, their wisdom to our students in a manner which our students can connect to what exactly is happening in industry. As far as I know, you know, first time I heard about that when this 5G is almost uh, there in this country. And, uh, you know, there are Indian companies I mean, Alliance, and uh, I don't know, I've heard of one more tech Mahindra and, you know, using an open RAN. I mean, I've only heard these terms. I'm not an expert on that, but they are work, coming together to, you know, deliver the, develop their own technology, which is a phenomenal improvement over, you know, what has happened so far up to the 4G. 
and of course india is a huge market you know for these technologies and probably because of our software strengths you know we are probably one of the people who would contribute enormously to the entire world so i certainly think that all our students are going to benefit tremendously from this uh, workshop and <clears throat> that is about all uh, i would welcome all of you and do take uh, really take interest in uh, what is delivered and i think if you can imbibe that it will help you tremendously because this is the future for next few years and you guys are probably stepping into the industry so it will help you tremendously thank you very much thanks samit thanks ankit okay thank you rakesh sir so now again i will invite our industry expert nilutpal to say a few words about this workshop uh, maybe one of the huge success it is going to be so nilutpal over to you yeah uh, thank you very much sir for the honor for giving us the honor of like participating in the workshop and delivering our know how to the participants so as mentioned in the workshop actually as mentioned by you the workshop is intended to be hands on the reason being that we often see that communication engineering in general is kind of uh, theoretical when we come to the books but we wanted to show as in how the translation from the theory can be actually provided to the practicality right and for that matter we would like to teach in this workshop as in how to translate our theoretical concepts and our frameworks into practical ones uh, software defined radio is something that i've been working for almost like 9 years now since my initial career at at national instruments i have been working uh, software in software defined radio and in my masters in in germany as well i have been using software defined radio so we had done uh, quite a lot of projects and products on software defined radios Uh, we want to bring or so to say uh, show how we want to actually create a, a knowledge transfer mechanism to the future engineers and researchers of the of the country so as that we can also start developing our own communication stacks and henceforth uh, be the import substitution when it comes to telecommunication and tactical communication in in defense uh, with this motive we have made the agenda in a way that it does a 360 degree coverage of all the concepts that needs to be understood for for any researcher academicians industries uh, to get started with the concept uh, sdr is now uh, considered to be two ways one is uh, one is the pro it is used as a prototyping platform when it says when i say a prototyping platform it means that i can validate my communication concept quite fast because there is already an rf front end available to me so that i can validate on right and the second thing is also sdrs have become very popular in terms of deployment as well specifically in tactical communication uh, where it uh, it basically contributes to the to the into the national security of the nation uh, sdr is a very vital vital uh, uh, electronic electronic component in this in this arena and import substitution can be highly expected through implementation of software stacks or communication stacks so to say full uh, full communication stacks on software defined radio right right from the range of radars to femto cells to small cells uh, to developing uh, to developing high uh, high speed drones uh, everywhere sdrs are used nowadays it has become the norm of the day so having the knowledge of course that's a very good move from the institute from the ipcc chapter that you've taken this as a priority and to to you know permeate the the knowledge of software defined radio among your participants mainly uh to the participants we will have a i hope we have a nice time uh, we'll try to deliver uh, the with the best of our abilities and uh, we'll try to make it smooth we'll not try to overburden too many things we'll try to make it smooth we'll try to uh, bring in the theoretical concepts as well as the practical concepts we'll try to create the bridge between the two so that it is very much relatable from what you are learning mainly right thank you very much everyone thank you to the respected dignitaries and the faculty members uh, it's been an honor and i hope uh, we would be able to deliver the best we can thank you okay thank you nilipal and also with us we have one of the senior most professor of department of electrical engineering professor suresh devaswayam uh, maybe i would like to request you also sir if you can say a few words about this workshop so suresh sir over to you please sure thank you very much uh, dr amit singh uh, i'm very happy to see the this workshop being organized uh, as we know uh, Uh, one thing that uh, national instruments has been saying for a long time is the software is the instrument uh, not only in radio but in also in uh, sensors and uh, uh, other instrumentation we find that there are standard blocks that are being made and the software defines the functioning of the 
uh, of those blocks. So in, in many ways, I think software is coming to play an important role and the hardware is becoming uh, quite standardized. And as, the, as Mr. Nilutpal uh, explained very well, it can be used both for prototyping uh, because once you uh, try out your ideas, you can then go ahead and uh, and customize things. So make it uh, so put in the software that you have developed into hardware again into uh, uh, and then make a, uh, a device. And you can also use it actually for deploying. So if you want to only deploy a small number like fifty or a hundred pieces, you can make this uh, and uh, deploy it for a customized uh, application. So I think the idea is, uh, of teaching this is very, very timely. And I think uh, all the organizers, especially Dr. Amit Singh has done a very good job and brought it in at the right time. And my best wishes to all of you. Okay, thank you, sir. So again, uh, just uh, in terms of formal inauguration, we are almost done. So now I would like to invite uh, first uh, uh, Ankit sir, just to have a vote of thanks. And then followed by that, we'll over to Suchitra. Ankit sir, yeah, for vote of thanks. Hello. Yeah, so I would like to thank all the participants for joining this workshop. And I would like to extend the sincere thanks to IIT General Community Director, sir, and Dean for helping us to organize this workshop and uh, all the financial supports and all the logistic supports that we have got from the Institute. And I would like to also thank all the organizers. And uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, all the volunteers for uh, helping us to organize this workshop. And uh, last but not the least, all my uh, 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 our resource persons from the industry and from the academy who have uh, uh, ready to spend some time with our students and participants. And uh, I would like to thank all the uh, persons involved directly and indirectly for organizing this workshop. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. So uh, thank you participants for joining us. So now the time is that we will go on board for this particular workshop. So now uh, we are going to start our workshop from here onwards. Now uh, the dais will be with you and uh, the controlling will be done by Nilutpal and his team completely. And with us, we will have our own team also. So once we will start, as per the instructions, all of you have received the software links and in the instruction, it was mentioned to download and install. So just for confirmation, uh, hope all of you may have downloaded those softwares so that we can go ahead smoothly. If any one of you have not downloaded the software, or if any one of you have any problem regarding that, you can write in the chat, chat box. You can write in the chat box. Now, I will request Nilutpal and his team to go ahead with the proceedings and uh, the schedule of the workshop. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Amal, and I am with the Avgadi team. I hope I'm visible, audible. So yeah. there is, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, the agenda for today, as Sir had mentioned, we would be covering um, the USRP in introduction to STR, which is towards the second half. But before that, what we would want to you know touch upon is the software platform that is used to program the uh, device. Uh, so a, a quick set of uh, you know ground rules let us establish one is that uh, you know let us try to keep these sessions uh, really interactive as much as possible uh, that would really help you know me also to get a feedback uh, and and you know it, it kind of uh, helps you also yourself as well to to you know each and every participant as well to get more clarity into what is being covered as well as you know Others also get more share of the knowledge that we are uh, imparting over here. So the uh, introduction or the preliminary idea, I just want to quickly uh, run you through a you know a simple demonstration. Um, okay, Amit sir, could you please uh, allow me to and en help do yes. screen sharing, please? Yes, it's done. Go ahead. So the the first part, what I would like to touch upon is a simple uh, idea into uh, you know what is an SDR. You know, 
the first idea i would like simply to get your perspective into what an sdr is and what you understand by a software defined radio system i'll i'll quickly give you a simple uh, case study so this is a this is a uh, implementation you know this happened in 2014 so this is a great example of how an sdr is used for you know, satellite communication this is an instance so the, the researchers a couple of researchers they were able to uh, reconnect with a space probe that has been traveling over the space for 36 years the system was actually decommissioned by nasa multiple years before and you know it was been a headline news that sdr is what actually allowed the team to recreate the communication systems and ultimately make the contact reboot the probe very quickly and with very little hardware cost they had a prototyping system they could reprogram it as per the requirement or as per you know the the various protocols various signal parameters everything included they were allowed or they were capable of reprogramming this device as per the requirement and they were able to do this over and over again without actually having to go back and change a hardware design so this is what a software defined radio helps you achieve now by definition let's let's simply try and understand what a software defined radio is right a software defined radio it's essentially a technology wherein software modules that are running on a generic hardware platform can be used to implement radio functions okay. so this means that you have various uh, you know parts or various systems in a communication system consider a simple digital communication system you start with a transmitter you have a transmitter between the transmitter and receiver you have multiple levels or different uh, processes that are involved so what we have shown here is a very simple system just a you know an overview and what happens in a, a software defined radio is that you take multiple pieces of it and bring it into a software environment so you continue having a generic hardware platform and the the the, the hardware would be interfaced with a software now that software helps you define having various apis different programming languages so right now i'm not talking about a specific vendor i'm talking about the str technology so in the str technology this is what happens that you have the software platform which gives you the you know amount of flexibility that is required to define various parameters i mean you start with even the the critical of things right uh, right like carrier frequency your bandwidths your modulation schemes all of these you are allowed to redefine right and um, you know as suresh sir very rightly pointed out and i had been you know talking about software defined instrumentation from way before you know from the inception from ni's inception that was the concept or that was the main idea of all the ni you know hardware and software that that ecosystem that you create was their idea and this is what trickled down into the platform of software defined radio as well which essentially is a you know a very much required technology for the future the the various applications that can uh, be touched upon for prototyping applications that they are really varied i mean you start with uh, aerospace and defense now there are uh, a lot of applications for this in the automotive domain connected cars satellite communications educational research is obviously an aspect which you know many of here, you here would be working on this even medical devices now are getting connected internet of things so you have a wide variety of applications in using a software defined radio right now what i would like to do is before going further into this let me take a you know stop here i would just want to show you this this ecosystem as i just want to show you this the software platform how it looks like what do i mean when i say that you know i will be able to control various parameters and prototype and then i will go into 
the software used. So the agenda of today, I'll repeat once more. The agenda of today is to give you an introduction to one of the platforms, one of the major platforms that we'll be using across the workshop, which is LabVIEW. Now, using the LabVIEW software, I'll show you an example or a demonstration first. Then we will touch upon the LabVIEW software. Uh, you know, you can try out various things. I'll cover the concepts initially. Then you can try out various things. Following that, we will go into a little more specific toolkits that we would be requiring or we would be using for this workshop. And the afternoon session, um, so the afternoon session, which would be specifically on the USRP hardware architecture, which is again, a generic hardware architecture that is used by all software defined vendors, both open source as well as NI in, in this uh, specific domain. Okay, let me just stop. Uh, this presentation. Uh, one uh, quick point is that there is a slight revision in the agenda. There was a you know personal emergency for one of our employees, so we are uh, shuffling a you know a, shuffling the personal around a bit. Uh, agenda will remain exactly the same. So today's uh, sessions would be covered by me. All the three sessions I would be touching upon. And uh, I think Nirutpal would be able to share the revised agenda with Sir today, and then Sir will circulate it to the participants. But the agenda, as it was shared by Amit Sir, it will remain exactly the same. There won't be any revision in the uh, the the content that would be covered, right? Okay. So this, what you see on the screen over here, right here, this is the LabVIEW software. Right. This is actually an example that has been. This is actually a program or a prototyping uh, code that we, as a company, have developed for uh, researchers and organizations who are working on software-defined radio. So, Avgade, as a company, we work uh, very much uh, focused into RF and wireless domain. We are a, we are an alliance partner to National Instruments, and um, our core area, the area of focus, is RF and wireless. We work with both academics as well as industry and even aerospace and defense customers for various applications so this was you know one of the um, one of the uh, prototyping platforms that we have built um, or software uh, framework that we have built rather for a ciso packet transceiver design so you would be cover you would be touching upon this in detail uh, day after tomorrow but today, what I want to show you is, you know, what the 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 entire uh, thing looks like. So, for example, this what you see over here on the screen is the LabVIEW software. Now, on the LabVIEW software, if you can notice where my mouse pointer is, you can actually notice that I am allowed to change various parameters of the radio, right? Using a software by changing parameters, the parameters like carrier frequency, I rate etc so by just by changing something on the screen over here i'm actually able to tune into a hardware platform okay so now this what you see on the screen this is a transmitter so this is a, this program will actually transmit a text message various other uh, coding schemes if you can notice that you can you can actually set the modulation type right you can actually set the coding you have a packet structure that you can define. So this is a packet transceiver. So you can you can define a packet structure, filter parameters. Then you have various visual indicators like constellation diagrams, I diagrams, the IQ waveform itself, right? So you have a lot of these uh, you know indicators or on the screen. The UI itself, uh, you know, kind of gives you the information. Over here on the right side, this is the message that I will be, you know, trying to transmit. So I'll run this transmitter program now. So essentially now this means that I am transmitting a message, which is this, right, the selected portion at one gigahertz frequency, 200 kilohertz bandwidth, QPSK modulation scheme, okay. With this particular packet structure, right? This particular packet structure. And as you can notice, your constellation is up. Okay. This is the what you see, the schematic right bottom corner that you see is what is actually being done here. You do source encoding, channel encoding, packetization, modulation, and upsampling. So this is what is actually being done in the program as well. So this 
is the transmitter. Now let me go to the receiver. So this is the receiver. Currently, I don't have any uh, anything received, but I will be tuning into the same one gigahertz. Okay, same IQ mm -hmm. rate I'm defining. Coding schemes should be the same. Packet structure should remain the same. And I would be selecting the QPSK modulation scheme itself. And I would run this program now. I'll run the program. And as you can see, I am receiving a constellation, which is after equalization looking like this. And you can notice that I am receiving this message over here as well. Okay. So essentially, over here, this involves receiving the data, filtering synchronization, then frame detection, estimation, channel estimation, equalization, and then finally demodulation. So this is your receiver. Now, both of these are running currently on the LabVIEW platform. And just to give you a perspective, I'll be showing you the, the program that is being used or the actual logic that is being used in the transmitter. So this over here, I'll, I'll explain all these things in detail. We will cover these things in detail later, but just to give you a perspective, this is something uh, called a block diagram where we are defining the program. Whatever process that we saw right now, we are defining that over here and you know, selecting various blocks or writing a graphical program together so that you will be able to implement these logic as you had expected to, right? So this is the LabVIEW software, the hardware, the USRP. Again, just to just to show you what it looks like. This, what you see on the right side, this is how the USRP looks. I have this on a remote connection at our office. So this, this system is remotely deployed over there. I am connecting through this, through a remote uh, software and I was running the programs on that. So over here, this is how the USRP looks like. And the USRP is actually being controlled by the LabVIEW software. So today's first half, the morning half, our agenda would be uh, exclusively limited to covering concepts on LabVIEW and getting a hands-on on the LabVIEW software. Okay. Essentially, just to give you an introduction or just an idea, essentially the uh, idea of an SDR architecture is that you have a multi-processor subsystem, which is a combination of a CPU and an FPG or a DSP, which is you know, entirely software definable. Then you have your RF to convert, you have your baseband converters. So your computers work in the digital domain. So from the digital domain, you want to convert the signal to analog. The final RF signal, they are analog in nature. So you have the baseband converters. So for transmission, you have the digital to analog converters. And for receiving, you have the analog to digital converters. And then you have the RF front end. So essentially, your RF front end is part of the USRP and your computer, which is connected to this, would run a software, in this case, LabVIEW. But just to uh, tell you the other side of it, when you work with open source, you would be having the um, yes, a USRP or any SDR, which is connected to the, again, the system that will run, let's say a program like the GNU radio to control the hardware. So this is the uh, very high level SDR architecture. Again, we will touch upon this in the afternoon in detail. Now let's go to the uh, lab view part. So uh, hope everyone was able to install the software uh, as, as was communicated. Our sessions will be hands-on. And uh, like mentioned, if you have any specific questions please put them in the chat or you know raise your hand you let's let's discuss uh, you know in in detail if, you, if there are any challenges that you are you know seeing okay uh, just to answer the questions in the chat right now the software uh, it is a proprietary software but you have a trial option for this there is no issue uh, 
Shu, Shudivyan Shu. There is no issue if uh, you know uh, it's on trial during the workshop period. You can have it on trial, and if you register your profile, you can extend the trial up to forty-five days as well. Um, okay, so I'll be starting off with LabVIEW. Okay, so um, just again, uh, a quick intro about me. I am a, a you know ex National Instruments to LabVIEW currently. Uh, one of the directors of, of Garde Systems, and the uh, parallelly, I'm also a certified LabVIEW developer and a professional instructor for National Instruments. So, which is why I thought I would take over the LabVIEW part so that the base is clear to you, and uh, you know, let's have a proper foundational course to understand the platform that we'll be using. We will be working on this platform entirely for the first four days till open source is being covered we will be working on this platform exclusively so please ensure that you pay attention i understand that this is uh, you know whatever we cover today might not uh, directly uh, be something uh, something related to rf and wireless but this is the platform it's a tool it's like any other tool that you use this is a tool that we would be needing hence i request you to pay close attention today and uh, you know please work with uh, me when we are doing any kind of exercises, when we are trying to do any demonstrations, please try to you know grasp what is being covered and uh, try to uh, ensure that you are you know doing the development during the exercises because it's a, it's a virtual mode. So you know the, what the challenges are. I think most of you are professors, so you know what the challenges are in the virtual mode. So please understand that even we have those challenges. So you know, try to cooperate and contribute the maximum that you can from your side. Right. So essentially what we saw now, that is LabVIEW, this software, that is LabVIEW. It is a graphical, uh, you know, programming environment, which is used by engineers and scientists to develop measurement, test and control systems. And, you know, one of those, you know, the, the, the systems, they are programming systems as we see in our case with the SDR. So essentially the platform is capable of interfacing with a variety of hardware devices. Uh, for example, data acquisition systems, sensor interfacing, control systems. You have a wide variety of applications. One of them is the software defined radio. So you would use the LabVIEW software to control the software defined radio using various APIs, uh, various logic you can implement. But let's quickly understand what it is. The uh, virtual instrument uh, it's it's a virtual instrumentation based platform that is the correct term or the term that ni uses for this the programs that you have in labview they are called a virtual instrument so let me open this labview at my side uh, right now you don't need to do this along with me sorry yeah so this is the first window that you would get the moment you open up labview now over here the program that you would be working with, the actual program that you'd be working with in LabVIEW is called a VI. Now VI stands for virtual instrument, which is what is called out over here. Now, why is it called a virtual instrument? Because any instrument that you control with, you know, LabVIEW, as you would have noticed over here also, this slide, sorry, this device, it does not have a display of its own. So everything that displays, controls, knobs, everything, as you noticed, it comes on the software. So essentially it appears like, or it imitates a physical instrument and hence the term virtual instrument. So you have oscilloscope, digital multimeters, everything, uh, you know, you've seen those. So as it appears on the device, you have that appearance brought into the software platform, which is LabVIEW. And the very essential or the most essential things that has to be there in the hardware ecosystem that is, you know, uh, that is brought onto the actual hardware system. And which is why you typically all these software defined instruments are very small in form factor. So especially when you are developing larger systems, it really helps you to reduce the form factor, the, the weight, et cetera. I and mean, you have other challenges also that you are resolving by using a software defined instrument. You have 
multiple components in the LabVIEW platform. One is the front panel, which is the user interface. And then you have uh, something called as the block diagram where you define the logic, right? So I'll quickly show a couple of things in LabVIEW as a demonstration. So the program opens from here, you go to file, say new VI. So these two windows open up. The moment you say new VI, these two windows open up. And as mentioned in the slide, this, the slightly grayish screen that you see, this is the front panel. Now on the front panel, what is allowed or what, what is the purpose of the front panel? The front panel is the interfacing element that you can use to kind of put all the graphical components or the user interactive components. So essentially your user interface, right? Correct term is essentially your user interface gets developed on the front panel. Now, how do you do it? Go to the front panel, right? You can when you right click on it you get something called as a palette now on the palette you can notice that you have various options like this knobs leds push buttons etc this are a set of components or the right terms again friend panel elements so i will classify them later right now all you need to understand is that you have a set of front panel elements on this, which is what you would be uh, working with as you are interfacing with the device or rather more precisely as you are controlling the device. So first part, front panel. Let's go to the second part. Now the second part is what you see over here, the block diagram. Now the block diagram is where you build the logic, whatever logic you need to implement the functionality that you're expecting, you have to implement a logic and this logic gets implemented on the block diagram. So look at it this way, your UI. So it's, it's very simple, right? If come imagine using a mobile phone application, the application that you work with let's say you are trying to book a cab over uber using uber you have your user interface exactly that is what your friend panel is complementary to i mean that is what it is whereas the app developers have built a logic right to 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 actually help you interface with the users i mean the back ecosystem so there the logic that program that has been written that is the block diagram now within this front panel and the block diagram, as you would have noticed, I'm tiling this left and right, window tile left and right. The moment I drop the front panel object, a corresponding block diagram terminal also has come up. So essentially the data that you give onto this, it gets pushed onto the terminal, okay? So let's try to do something very simple. Pay close attention as I'm doing this. You can do this right after I'm done. So for example, you know, something very simple. Let's try to add two numbers. Okay, so how do you do that? I have dropped a numeric control. So a numeric control is what helps you give data into the program. Okay. Then you have you need one more numeric control. So this, whatever you see, these two, they are your numeric controls. And as I'm dropping this over here, a corresponding terminal has appeared on the block diagram. Okay. The terms used are controls and 
indicators. Okay. So controls are the items which are required to give data into the program. And as I'm done with the processing, if I have to display the result, essentially I'm giving data out from the block diagram towards different panel, I would use something called as an indicator. So I have two controls, one indicator, and as you can notice, the corresponding terminals have appeared on the block diagram. Now, just like I would right click on the front panel and obtain a controls palette, okay, a controls palette, On the block diagram, if I right click, I get something called as a functions palette. Now the functions palette, it enables you to access the various functions, the APIs, any kind of logic that is uh, programmed into the system. I mean, it starts with simple primitive functions like addition, subtraction, etc. Then it goes to a little advanced set of functions. So for example, in our case, there is something that we would cover called as a modulation toolkit. So, for example, that modulation toolkit. So all these things would be covered in the, or would be showing up rather under the functions palette, which appears the moment I right click on a block diagram. So here, what I want to do is let's say simple, add two numbers. So I'll go to numeric and select add, and I'll drop this over here. Okay, so now you can notice that the program has, within the program, there are three components. First one is the actual input part, right? Input into the program, I mean, you should think of it that way. Then you have the output. And between the input and output, the actual data processing. Okay. Now, after this is done, again, Pay very close attention. This is very important. After this is done, how do you interface these? So this is done by a very simple logic, which is called wiring. So you bring your mouse pointer, as you can notice, this is my mouse moving. You bring your mouse pointer towards the terminal that you want to wire it from. The moment you do that, your mouse pointer changes, you know, the, the actual cursor it becomes in a different way it looks like a drum it's it's a wiring tool it's called a wiring tool the technical term is wiring so you essentially wire between this the block i am not clicking it now all i've done is i've clicked on one terminal and then the mouse is loose anywhere i can take this but for me what i want to do is i want to take this onto the function the function has two input terminals in addition function, simple addition functions, which adds two numbers. So I've brought it towards the addition function and drop this over here. So now you have an addition function towards which A is wired. In a similar way, now I'm going fast. If you have any questions or any problems with this, you come back later. I'm just going fast now. I just keep clicking and wiring. So essentially I have a logic, which is A plus B equals to x so you have an input you have a data processing you have an output so let's put a couple of data points over here and i'll run the program now so as you can notice that the result of these this addition is showing up over here so this is the most basic funda of lab view now from here from over here another thing that you can notice is you have way more number of functions and as you would, uh, you know, this is a big programming language, a typical fundamental trainings, uh, fundamental training to this, it might it takes weeks and then you know, more days and days of practice as well, which means that you will also keep encountering new functionalities as we go along day by day. One, secondly, if you are really interested to work on this platform, it means that after the training also, you have to spend some time. Like I mentioned, you have 45 days of trial, which essentially means that uh, after this uh, program is over, you would still have around you know 38 days to work with the platform. 
so if you are really interested to work on this please ensure that you uh, extend the evaluation and work with the platform uh, continuously work with the platform hello okay uh, uh, continuously work with this platform for uh, you know a longer duration now this is the first part so how do you actually develop a program right the terms that you need to remember are controls indicators functions now after functions you have again like i said more functionalities a simple example could be file logging so many of you might be interested in logging the data that you receive from let's say the usrp or you want to do something like a high quantity data logging so here you have this function for example called write to file my point is we will not touch upon this right now but my point is this is a function which you can use to uh, write data into a file now this function it is called a sub vi a sub function that you can call from this function so just like again i'm sure all of you have some programming background or you know if not also you can just understand or try to head, try to grasp this point that any program to build a actual end application you need to address or you need to call out to various sub programs here as well that is applicable and that means you have that uh, the generic term is sub functions over here the term is sub vi so we have various sub vi's that will be required by you to develop a program okay i'll remove this part Let's go back to the presentation. So we have already seen the numeric data type. I'll quickly run you through the data types and then I'll go back and I'll show it. And then together, uh, and once that is done, you can quickly try it out. There is nothing like an exercise, but I would want you to, you know, just quickly explore the platform. But I'll quickly cover the data types. What are the different data types? So what we have, what we can start with, is the front panel, the which the sorry front panel data types. You have the numeric controls and indicators. You have Boolean data type. So numeric is purely numbers. Within numeric, there are subclassifications. We will come to that later. Uh, next one is Boolean data type, which is essentially a true or false kind of data. can be used for push buttons leds toggle switches etc so essentially you write a logic you write a program you want to stop that program you have to use a boolean control right okay. you have string data type uh, there is no uh, individual uh, character data type here you have only a string data type by default it can take Uh, a single character or multi character so it's a it's a sequence of ascii characters by definition and all these front panel objects they have again shortcut menus of themselves so you can actually right click on them and define any kind of properties function nodes part of the block diagram sub vi nodes again we covered this there is a third type which is called the express vi's uh we will be seeing one of those also during the uh, exercises that we do and what we use to connect between the various objects they are called the wires now again within labview itself there are scalar data there is vector data there is array data which can be multi dimensional as well so the wires keep getting thicker as you keep building up on the array so a scalar will be a thinner wire 1d array would be thicker 2d array would be even thicker so it goes like that with the data type there are changes in the colors of the wires as well so i'll quickly show that also to you the double numeric which we use now that is orange in color you can have integer numeric which is blue in color string is for example pink in color let's go back to the software once more after this you can try and you know implement this logic let me bring a simple case i'm just saying i am this is a or gate this 
as a boolean indicator or just to ensure that the names are different let me name it as z used to switches see all your standard shortcuts like control c control v work so you can do control copy easily like that so these are your boolean controls now so essentially i have these controls in this indicator okay now you can notice this color is green and as i let's say run the program right now this is not turning on i'll turn on one of the boolean buttons i'll run the program again and notice that the boolean has turned on okay uh quickly one more thing i'll make a quick copy of this and you can notice that uh, as i mentioned the right click gives you a properties of this uh, particular uh, component so here you can go here and change the representation so you have various representations uh, i will not go into details of each of these people who are familiar with normal programming c c++ programming you can understand that these uh, data types uh, the i they stands for signed uh, you know integer u stands for unsigned integer these are standard practices that are used in any programming language u8 is unsigned 8 bit integer i8 is signed 8 bit integer uh a double is a 64 bit double precision data type which can take decimals as well right which can take data after decimal points as well so it's a floating point data uh single is 32 bit similar floating point data and in in rf we would also be using something called as a complex double data type which is the cdb this is where my mouse pointer is right now so at the moment i'll i'll try working with i32 i'll change the representation of all the modules to i32 like this and let's say i'll run the code and as you can notice this guy it does not allow you to put any kind of decimal points moment i drop or drop it out it just rounds off to the nearest value okay the logic still works right so i want you guys to you know spend a couple of minutes quickly explore the platform open up front panel block diagram try to build one of these i mean you don't need to build all try to build one of these so bring something down to the front panel then to the block diagram uh, wire the logic together and just see the results this is the run button so can you take 5 minutes and quickly do this exercise if you have any questions please ask and uh, yeah with installation also if there are any challenges you can probably just let us know participants software is completely downloaded with you installed with you any of you if fail any problem let us know Okay, so uh, if, if you have the softwares, then please go ahead with uh, uh, the implementation. And if you feel any problem, please ask. And I will request try to be as interactive as possible because in virtual mode, it, this itself is a big problem. So. if you feel any problem let us know
IIT Jammu students, have you implemented? Oh, yes, sir. Um, it's perfectly working for me, like I'm doing right now. Oh. Okay, uh, which edition? Okay, so um, you may, so as long as you're installing it on your personal computers, you may download the community edition. Uh, runtime edition is uh, different. Uh, do not download the runtime edition. You can either download the community or full professional, either ones. Full and professional, if you're installing on any of the institute computers mm -hmm. uh, or professional, the ones that has been provided by your organization to you, uh, do not install community edition. There are legal liability, legal issues. Install either full or professional development systems and you turn it on trial. Your purely personal systems that you have and you are sure that you will not use it for any commercial purposes, you can use the community edition. Do not use the runtime one because runtime is different. Runtime is when you, I mean, just to give you perspective, the runtime uh, back runtime software is uh, when you have, let's say you build an application. Uh, LabVIEW also allows you to deploy uh, softwares, right? So for example, uh, the software, once you build this, you can deploy it onto another system where you don't need a developmental license. All you need is a runtime license. So the runtime engine is just a backend for that. So uh, do not download the runtime edition, you can download full professional. Uh, Amit sir, there's a question on the video recording availability. Uh, so uh, somebody is asking, can the recorded video be available later? Uh, some of the parts of the video, we may make them available, but not the entire one. So better to attend in online mode. And some of the critical parts that we will upload somewhere on our YouTube channel. Just some critical part, not almost all. Shayush Kumar getting an error while installing the full professional. Okay. If community is working for you, Mr. Ayush, you can proceed with that also, it's fine. With the uh, everyone participants, please notice whatever programs that you're working on, do not uh, discard them or delete them. Um, I, I personally urge you to kind of, you know, save it somewhere in your system so that you can have it for future access as well. And some exercises, it will be easier for us also to kind of continue working on existingly uh, already developed code rather than developing from scratch. So uh, you should either have it open on your system and um, 
you know, it, it's better you save it and keep it, my recommendation. Okay, anyone, any questions? Okay, guys, let's keep it a little more interactive. If it's working, say yes. Uh, sir, actually, I have an issue with the sub VIs. Like, I didn't catch it properly, I think so. Okay, so this part you are not able to do? No, sir, it's perfectly fine. So that sub VIs, that sub functions that you are talking about. Okay, so sub functions, I'm saying some, some. Um, so you are, there are three classifications that you have in, in the lab view uh, functions that you see, whatever on, whatever, block diagram functions that you see, there are three classifications. It starts with a primitive function like this, which is addition. This function, it's an inherent feature within LabVIEW. Whereas if you, let's say, go to a function like this, right? This, if you double click on it, it will have its own front panel and block diagram. So essentially, this function has been written using other available components in LabVIEW, whereas this is a very primitively available component. You cannot double click and go anywhere. So if you are looking at, let's say a signal processing based example or you know, better, uh, let's go to the modulation toolkit. So for example, let me go to the modulate FM. So this is a function that is developed for a specific purpose of FM modulation. Now, all of us know that there is a mathematical backend to it. Now, the logic for the same has been developed like that, right? So you can keep going inside, and finally, you will hit a hit a block wherein this various mathematical functions have been used to develop that logic. So a sub VI. It uses other LabVIEW functions at its backend to develop that functionality. Whereas the functions, they are the most primitively available functions in LabVIEW. Does that sound fine? Uh, yes. Sir. And so uh, one more question, like, uh, can we make our own sub VIs? Like yes, yes, you can. You can. I am not sure if we'll be able to cover this, but uh, I'll quickly show you a very simple thing so that uh, I'll start I'll start immediately after this, guys. So let's say this is a function that I have put in place. Let me create, you can also create a control like this. So something like this. So I have now three inputs. Again, let me add one more to just give you perspective. These are just a series of, uh, you know, These are constants that you can have that does not have a front panel element. Okay. So I'll show you something. What if I want to take this part of the logic, this much part of the logic, and I want to make it into a sub function. Just, just an example. So this is the easiest way of doing it. You develop the logic and as you are seeing that, you know, uh, you would want to reuse this. I mean, now you have to look at what is the purpose of creating a subway also. So what if you want to reuse this logic elsewhere? So that is when you create a subway, one of the major reasons. What if you want to reuse? So you just select this portion, go to edit, go to edit and say create sub VI. This is a new sub VI. And this sub VI, it has its own block diagram and front panel wherein this functionality has been implemented. Okay, so got it. Thank you. I'll try. It. And you can, if you want to access this elsewhere, one last thing, if you want to access this, access this elsewhere, you just drag and drop this icon over here. If you want to access this from a new program, just drag and drop this guy like this. And uh, one final thing, I will not go into this. If you want to edit this icon, how this appears, or so just go go and say edit icon. 
you will get a window like this this are very you know very much this is very much like paint and all so you can actually work on this platform uh, to edit the icons you can save these sub va separately wherever you want and uh, you know, work with them for us any specific functionality as you like okay so uh, shall i resume i'm, I'm resuming if you have any questions uh, further questions we can probably take it up uh, during the break or you can put it in the chat window and we'll address it as we go along um not seeing any raised hands also okay so i'm proceeding now a couple of uh, additional functions that you will be uh, you know interested to know as first one is the moment i had more of these functions or sub vi's as we were you know referring to so for example i bring in an rf communications module now what does this function do what is the purpose and all if i have to know i need to get access to a context help window as we call it which is accessed by clicking on control and h together control h which is context help you bring it over here it describes what this function does I mean, just to give you some simple example addition it just says compute the sum of the inputs over here it says it writes the data to a delimited spreadsheet file this function what does it do it does a modulation uh, performs an amplitude modulation on an rf carrier wave with the optional separation of carrier wave so this is the explanation for what this is another thing that we would be exploring or you would want to work with is something called as a example finder which again will not go into now but just go to help and say find examples you will uh, get an example launcher wherein you can search um, a lot of things that you know you would be trying to work with have already been developed in labview so it's it's always recommended to see what is available not only inside and inside labview we can even work with uh, the uh, forums so there are ni forums online forums the usrp has a very dedicated forum because a lot of people globally are working on usrps now so there is a dedicated forum for usrp so you can search or you can you can work on those platforms get the example codes then modify it as per your requirement right i mean that is the that's the best part of a software platform even you know people who work in very big organizations even they work like that for i mean just a simple example is stack overflow i'm sure software programmers know very well about stack overflow so that is a a simple platform that you have similarly ni forums and i example finders can be used essentially how you do the functionality is most important so that you end up doing that through the right tools that is available to you so use the example finder use the online forums Uh, a, a couple of troubleshooting steps also i'll just show you again i'll not uh, demonstrate i'll not uh, go ahead and set an exercise for it but one of them is highlighting of execution so if you just enable this bulb notice this in the block diagram and you run the program it is more it is more like a slowed down version of the execution of this particular program which helps you to understand if there are any errors now on this program itself let's try and do a couple of uh, interesting um, you know more explorations we have covered the data type uh, changing this data type representation so this one you remember please what does the data type representation is possible uh, i'll quickly touch upon two other data types then we will go into a new logic so keep this program open or I'll, i'll like don't close it off i'll just quickly show you two other data types that you might be you know that will be helpful or that we will require the first amongst those are strings the string like i said is a data type which allows or supports ascii uh, characters a combination of ascii characters this is the input string you have various string manipulation functions also 
I mean, just to give you perspective, I'll just use a simple function, which is uh, concatenate strings. And I let's say this is a concatenation function which merges the two strings together. I'll run this code now. I'll get say, and just a simple example. Just want to show you the data type. Another one is called the enumerated control. Enumerated control essentially is a hybrid of string and numeric. It is used to when it is used to when you want to limit the options of a uh, of a user to certain number. So, for example, if uh, let's say you ask, uh, let me take a very layman type of example. Let let's or no, let's let's use a RF relevant example as well. So, let's say that. So let's say you ask the programmer to select a modulation scheme. Now, when you're trying to do that, if you are, let's say, giving an entire flexibility to the user, the user might do anything. User might uh, say QPSK like this. Right? Another user might put it in small letters. Let's say your program has only four options and you have not programmed um, let's say something like FM and the user selects FM, you have not programmed it, then that's an issue, right? So the, you want to limit the user's choice to what functionality or features are available, which is what enumerated control helps us with. So enumerated control So for example, we have already, uh, I will show you this, uh, the same thing that has already been implemented over there. So the in the example that I was showing you, right? So your modulation schemes are really limited now. You have only three options, which which you as a programmer have restricted the user to have. Okay, this is enumerated control. So string enumerated control. Enumerated control, we will come back to this example again later. Uh, we would try and build on something called as a case structure in this program. But before that, let's quickly cover the, uh, the, the logic of iterative programming. So over here, in the block diagram, I have something called as loops. So again, programmers, you'll be familiar with what loops are. I'll, all I will be uh, doing is just showing you how to use it. Here, just to give you perspective, if you run the program once without this thing on, yeah, it's just a single execution. The program executes once. Whereas if you want this to execute continuously, you introduce a loop into the program like this. So you, once again, right click, go to while loop, drop this around the logic, right click on this and say create control. That is the stop button used to stop the program as and when needed. I will run the program. And you can notice that the program is still in the running condition. You are not allowed to change anything here. Here also, okay, all you are allowed to do is change the data. And as you can notice, as I'm, cha as I'm changing the data over here, you can notice that the output is varying accordingly. Okay. So this is an iterative execution based program. What you can do is you can quickly try and uh, start with this. Uh, 
we have a break at 11:30 so what we will do is you can continue this okay we'll reconvene back at 11:45 if you have any questions on this we'll pick it up then and continue from there um is that fine participants please respond yes sir it's perfectly fine yes okay. sir thank you IT Jammu participants, there is a special message for you all. Just have a look in chat box.
Ramati, are you there? Ramati, please reply. And you are asking for?
currently we are just going through a small break again we will sharply start at 1145 IT Jammu students, please respond as soon as possible. The link is perfectly working fine. Use your IIT Jammu account. I uh, hope all of you are back. Uh, I think uh, let's start again. And again, I request participants try to be as interactive as possible. Then only we can make this online session, virtual session in this pandemic useful. Please be cooperative. Yeah, please go ahead, Amal. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Okay. So uh, let me just share the screen. Okay.
Okay. So over here, this is what we had done. Um, essentially, what we have here is a logic that is iterating at a specific rate, uh, which is you know, the maximum possible, which, which is permitted by the system. So if you had any issues with doing the exercise, because see, this is something that I've just put over the loop. I've just added a loop over your existing logic. So it shouldn't take long. All you need to do is go to programming structures, while loop, and define, you know, just build this logic around that block of code that you've selected. Last this. 15 minutes, all of you ensure that you have uh, uh, plotted your answers. Okay. So this, this is the, uh, you know, logic, which is iterating. And you can, you can notice one point that you know you can you are allowed even if you have or you define a while loop like this you are 100% allowed to have a separate logic which is outside the loop as well right which means that if i let's say build up some space over here you can in fact have a separate logic which essentially involves you know let's say a simple uh, addition of array elements. So just quickly touch upon arrays also in this way. So I've just, I, I'm quickly creating a simple array, the blank array into which I'm dropping a numeric control. So let me make it a three element array. Let's say four, so three elements, select this function, put this array sum, Okay, so if I run the logic now, this part of the code, the program is now running. Pay attention, please. The program is now running, but if I enable execution highlighting, you can notice that only this part of the program is running continuously. So whatever is in the loop only is running continuously. Whatever is outside the loop, even if you change the data, it won't work because this is not inside the loop. So the iterative execution, only what is inside the actual loop structure iterates continuously. Okay. <laughs> Any questions here? I'll also touch upon another type of loop, which is the for loop. Now this particular for loop, it allows you to, uh, so while loop, what is the end condition? You keep checking the condition at the end of every iteration which essentially in this case is a stop button. You can build any Boolean logic because that accepts a Boolean uh, Boolean data. I mean, if you notice the color of the wire, notice this is a Boolean data. So if you want, you can build a logic over here and serve it towards this. It's very similar to your uh, do while loop in C++. And uh, here for loop, you predefine the number of iterations that you want it to execute. So if you are saying that you want this, this particular loop to execute 50 number of times, uh, any iterations, I mean, it will essentially execute 50 times. Following that, it will stop. So again, I mean, just showing you, this is, I mean, this 50 would have entered by now, but this 50 uh, iterations, this thing would run for, and this would run till the time you press the stop button. So that's a fundamental difference between a for loop and a while loop. Just, uh, you don't need to do this. Just take a look and see where it is. This is the for loop. Right beside it is a while loop. Okay. This is the first part. We have one more concept to cover in LabVIEW basics. Then we will go into the uh, next section's agenda, which is math script and modulation toolkit. Uh, one more concept. And uh, I want you to do an exercise also on that. This one, hope it is completed. The first loop, creation of a loop. Uh, yes, sir. Um, okay, I yeah, can thank you. So uh, one 
minor point is how to time a loop. So right now, this terminal I, it shows what is the uh, current iteration the loop is at. So if you create an indicator over here, and you run the code, you can notice how fast the execution is proceeding. So what if you don't want the execution to proceed that fast? So what, what logic do you implement for that? There is a timing function that is available for you in this uh, in the in the block diagram in the functions palette, wherein you use this wait function. You can provide a certain number of milliseconds you want the loop rate to be at. So one millisecond, it means that the loop will iterate once every one millisecond. So let me give 100. So now you pay attention to the iteration. You can notice that it is going at the rate of 10 iterations a second or once in every 100 millisecond. To make it more you know, intuitive, let me put add one more zero. This will iterate it once a second. So you can very clearly notice that it is going, the iteration terminal, it is going at this particular pace. So this is the timing. Now, the main critical, uh, one of the main critical components in LabVIEW that I would like to cover today we have touched upon the concept of loops. We have touched upon the concept of um, both for loop and while loop. Just running through what is available. My slide deck. Cover timing as well. Participants, please ensure you're unmuted. It's, a, it's difficult. There's noise from the other side, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so data flow. This is a concept. So this is, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with LabVIEW, or in fact, any other graphical languages, this might be new to you. So essentially, whatever we have covered now, these are LabVIEW fundamentals. Now we will go to something called as data. This is a little bit of theory. There is no uh, you know, specific exercise followed by followed to this. This is the core theory that I want you to clearly understand. So any LabVIEW program that you define, the any LabVIEW program that you define, it follows the concept of data flow. So um, let's look at a simple C program that you would have developed where you've written, let's say 10 lines of code. The 10 lines of code that you would have written, it executes line after line. So essentially it is called a sequential execution. So sequence in which the code has been written, exact sequence it follows for execution as well. So it's called a sequential programming that you do. Love you does not work in sequential programming. It does not matter how physically you have placed the components in the program. All that matters is how you have wired the data components or the various block diagram components together. It's a, it's a very niche minute difference, but what you need to understand, and this is some, for some people, it is very intuitive. I understand that you might be thinking why I'm over explaining this. For some people, this is very intuitive. For some, there, there is a confusion, which is why I'm be, being very clear on this. It does not matter how you place the objects on the block diagram. It only matters how you wire between them. And why that is? Because LabVIEW follows this model of data flow for running of a VI. Now, what does data flow mean? In simple terms, data flow, uh, it, it's, it fundamentally implies that you have these inputs number uh, it, it says one and two these are the inputs there is a constant 50 and there is a result fundamentally all it means is whatever i was showing you in that highlighting of execution that over here you know as my I'll just make it a laser pointer so that <clears throat> as i am you know moving along this particular wire as i start with the execution data will go from these two uh, controls towards function data will come from here towards this function. Once addition function executes, then only data will go from here to subtraction. 
from subtraction with these data points together, it will go towards the result. So data flow through the wires and it follows a rule of data flow. I mean, simple terms, this is what it means that data comes like this, comes like this, and then together so the execution happens here. After the execution data goes outside. After that, it pushes the data out towards the result. But very specifically, in a very theoretical manner, what it means is these two things, the lines that are there. The first one is that a node executes only when data is available at its input terminals. Okay. A node <laughs> only when data is available at its input terminals. And the second one is that a node supplies data to the output terminals only when the node finishes execution. Now, this, what does this mean? The simple term, the simple term is that your addition over here, it will wait for data. Last to five minutes. Last five minutes. It will wait for the data to come from these two towards this addition function and the output of the addition function will go to the subtract function. Now, this the second rule here that the node here, it gives data out to the next one only when it finishes execution. So this is a big difference from a sequential programming, wherein in sequential programming, you look at variables, variables can have junk data. I mean, again, for programmers who are very clear with this, you, you would have noticed that there is something called an initialization of variables. That is because each variable can have some, you know, re retained values that are some memory junk elements that has to be replaced. Here, that is not needed because junk value does not come out from this addition terminal till the time addition executes. So only valid data comes out. So that is the second point. First point is, for example, you take a look at the subtract terminal, data 50 is available immediately. But even if the data 50 is available immediately, it will take the data, it will, it will do the execution only once the data is available from over here at this input terminal of the first input terminal of the subtract function. So these are the two points that you should have in terms of data flow. Now I have a quick question for you. Assume this is the block diagram, this is the entire block diagram, okay? Uh, if you consider this to be an entire block diagram, Bangalore HL is near me, so. Okay, so uh, if you take a look at this block diagram, you can see there are multiple functions, addition, subtraction, random number. This is, this is called a random number function. All it does is it generates a random number, division and sine wave generation. So consider this to be part of a single diagram. Which function, which node, so when I say function amongst this executes first? You can answer in the chat, you can talk. Add okay. So Asta is saying add. Anybody else with a different opinion? Okay. Muktar is saying sign. Okay. Purvi is saying. Uh, Ms. Purvi is saying add and sign they will work together, right? So yeah, you are close. The reason being, see, there is the implication of this rule. The implication of this data flow rule is that you have to look at the dependency. You have to look at which is dependent on which. So this division function, it does not have any dependency on any other input terminals, correct? Whereas if you look at the subtract and sinusoidal functions, subtract and sinusoidal functions, there is a dependency from the previous terminal. So obviously uh, I can rule out these two. And then I look at the other three, I can see that it could be either of the three that executes first. It, it is not a definitive answer. Again, the reason being computers follow a lot of 
you know processes to execute these command sets uh-huh. there are concepts like multi threading again if you uh-huh. familiar concepts like multi threading multi tasking etc so all these processes which are independent of each other they are allowed to execute independently within a processor okay so as long as there is no dependency in this case between addition random number as well as division you are noticing that there is absolutely no dependency amongst the digit or dependency for them from another terminal the controls the 1 2 3 the four the controls the data is readily available there so there is no dependency so possibly it could be addition or random number or uh, division whereas uh, one thing that we can be 100% perf- uh, you know 100% confident of is the fact that subtraction as well as sinusoidal function will not first remember this because this will come again as you go along no one will explain this concept again but you need to know this to understand the programs that have been written okay this is the concept of automatic multi threading so that is uh, a follow up to this because each of these each of these uh, threads or that you see they run on separate threads in lab view and you have the capability of parallel code paths to execute in unique threads okay start no. writing and upload your answers yeah question Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, am I sir? Yeah, yeah, please go on. Yeah. Sir, like why it's not certain? Like uh, why you you write the like possibly? Why it's not certain that all three are working at the same time? Okay. So um, I'm. I'll try to answer that in a simple way because the moment I'm getting this to be complicated, I'll have to go into computer architectures. See, this is the this is the answer. So you are you are working with a processor, okay? Any processor that you have, it has you know multiple things to take care of, right? you have the software running on it but the processor it will have it will have on its own the operating system to run it serves interrupts so there are various priorities that all these processes are working with so whatever we saw here these three the addition the div- the random number as well as the division they are three independent processes meaning it does not have any dependency with anything from before is that part clear but from there each of this get deployed the, my, the the minutest of the tasks that gets deployed on to the uh, you know processor there is computer architecture i'm not going there but it goes as three separate processes to the processor between these three there is no specific order of preference because all these three they are equally important to lab view as well as the processor okay now the processor uh, once it gets all these okay it does something called as multi threading so the number of processor cores that are available on your system this thread each of these threads they have the capability of going and working on these multiple threads they they are completely capable of doing that and obviously these threads or these multi core processes they also are serving other tasks i mean okay i'll take a very simple example let's say you guys are someone one of you guys are listening to music and doing the programming when I mean, it's it's a normal thing to do right you and that particular parallel process that is running it also has a share of the processor resource right for us human beings perceivably all these three will execute together essentially the addition oh. random number and division will execute together in our perception but the exact time you you look at it in processors nanosecond timelines because these are separated out in this manner there is a possibility that one of them might finish up earlier 
one of the matriarch a little later but on firstly those three the addition the random number and the division will execute first only following then the subtraction and the sign wave executes does answer your question yeah okay sir got it thank you okay so now one last one last exercise in lab view which is we have already touched upon this uh, concept of enumerated controls okay so using this using this what i'm going to do is i'm going to introduce you to another uh, another structure again very commonly used in your workshop which is called the case structure <clears throat> okay so this is the case structure under structures case structure the modulation scheme which you have selected your choices were between bpsk qpsk and apsk the modulation scheme you wire it directly to this particular terminal which is called the case selector now you'll understand what this means each sub diagram the name is sub diagram each sub diagram over here has bpsk qpsk and as long as you go to uh, select add case after or for add case for every value will have an 8 psk also so i'll just just to uh, you know help you differentiate between these what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a boolean led dpsk this is the first one so this is the second led the qpsk so i'll go to qpsk coming here okay and i'll go to hpsk finally i'll make another clone sorry this is the third one so essentially i have different sub diagrams for each which means that depending on the selection that i give here in the enumerated control this particular sub diagram will execute i'll show you also so what i will do is i'll quickly build a simple logic this is nothing all i am doing is the moment uh, a, a particular modulation scheme is selected that led will light up others will not bpsk okay i'm enabling execution highlighting pay attention i'm going to select bpsk and i'll run the code as soon as it reached here it selected that first piece of the code and this is the data that got generated right now you can try the other one also i select upsk from the code again right so now qpsk got selected so that sub diagram concept the key structures concept is simple that whatever selection you do accordingly this will execute accordingly that piece of the code will execute i mean to make it a little more obvious or clearer i'll drop one more case structure and you can do the exercise on either of this <coughs> sorry i'll drop one more enumerated control okay this is i'm, I'm going to choose between uh, addition or subtraction or probably multiply okay you have two options i'll go to right click edit items <coughs> add okay 
multiply and say okay i'll drop it over here and i'll wire it like this now you can notice that i have two logics very quickly i'll bring in some uh, logic from the other program that we already have So A and B, this is where my addition is. I'll bring it out as an output. I'll create an indicator. Result. This is the result. This is the function to be chosen. And then I'll go to the multiply diagram. I'll drop a multiplication, rest everything. It remains like this. So, what will happen now? This is one part piece of the code. Let that remain the same. I'll select UPSK only. Over here, I'll select addition. Looking at 5 and 78. Okay, let me bring 70 and 78. Addition. Okay. Execution highlighting is on. I'll run the code. As addition got selected and the result is addition. Now if I select select multiply, run the code. Notice that it's switching over to multiply and that the result I'm getting is of the product. Okay, so now you can choose either of this. Take five minutes and you know do the exercise. So with this, the lab B introduction part will be done and we'll move on to the two specific modules that will be, you know, we have been asked to work with. Okay. Any questions if you have, please ask. Otherwise, to uh, proceed with the exercise, we'll wrap up in five minutes. You can do either of this. Don't do both, do either of this. It's fine. Use an enumerated control. You can get it from here. Right click on it and say edit items to get the various items within this. And then to drop down this case structure, where do you get the case structure from here? You get the case structure, put the results. So either of this you can do. Please press it.
Purvi, have you simulated this? Paramjit, have you simulated? Mukul, Aiman Mishra, any of you have you simulated this or not? Please say. Selective value is not unique. Um, that happens when you have duplicated the, any cases or there is an extra case over here. That is only when it would happen. Just just check the sel for selector values are not unique option. Have you do you have any uh, duplication here or here? Or, you know, if you do not have cases for all the values over here, it would be either of those. And anyone uh, facing any issues with activation, uh, you can, uh, you know, we can connect. Uh, the session is, the session is uh, ending at 12.45. We can connect at 12.45. Uh, we can, you know, take care of the activation part there. So if you have an issue there. Okay, great. Others, uh, can we proceed? Thank you. 
Okay. Now we will cover one of the uh, topics again that we would be using later. Again, within LabVIEW itself, a different structure. Uh, you guys, please keep these saved. Uh, I will not be asking you to reuse these, but uh, you know, for your own reference, it's better to keep these saved in your local drive. So it's 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 better to do that. So request you to keep these things saved, whatever you're doing, for later reference. I'm gonna uh, okay, do one thing. Let me also bring up a new VI so that in case anyone has any doubts towards the later part of the day, I can you know address those as well. Okay, so. What I'll do now is bring up a new VI. Right over here. Okay. So now uh, let's see. The, so this this agenda. I mean, agenda of this part of the session, uh, which is uh, this. There are two. One is to uh, introduce you to something called as a modulation toolkit. The second one is, is something called as Math Script. So the modulation toolkit will be extensively uh, dealing with later as well. So I'll, I'll not really do a hands-on there, uh, but there is a, something called as a Math Script, which I would want you to you know, do as a proper hands-on. So now um, let's let's quickly see what the Math Script is. Okay. So LabVIEW, we have already spoken. It's a graphical programming language. You have various options uh, of you know, putting and picking blocks and elements in place. But I'm, I'm sure you know certain applications would require textual programming, one. Secondly, certain researchers in, in your group, I mean, but in, from within the participants group might be more interested to use a math script more of a MATLAB kind of a script code to work with uh, algorithms specifically, which is why LabVIEW has these two structures. One is called the formula node and the second one is a math script node. Uh, I will not touch upon the formula node, but just for your reference, formula node is a very simple block that can be used to, to you know build or type in textual math. Uh, logic would be very similar to what you, know, you see in uh, what you see in C, but not much functions, etc. It's more like if you want to add 10 numbers, you can just add in variables and you know build that logic onto the formula node. What we would see is the math script, which is essentially the M script that uh, you know that you have. The 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 math script as it is, what you have here, it's a block which helps you essentially to Which helps you essentially to build a logic in textual manner using math scripts. So just, just taking a simple example, I mean, you are allowed to, let's say, type in a code like A is equal to B raised to two. Okay. When this is allowed. But the moment you do this, the moment you do this, you have to define what, let's say, B is. So for you know, introducing you to arrays once more, what I can do is I can say that, okay, I'm adding an input, I right click over there and say I'm adding an input, B is defined, now this is B. Now whatever I wire into B, that would be B. I mean, I can wire a numeric like this, perfectly fine. Okay, um, I can have, let's say an array also. So I will not do this. What I will do is I will give an array over here. So let me go to data containers array. I'll define a numeric array again. Let's have three elements. Okay. I'll say one, two, and three. Sorry. Three. 
Now this, I can name it anything, but let, for convenience sake, for us to understand things better, I've named it P itself. So this is data that is generated in LabVIEW coming from this user interface, but it is going to the max grid. Now over here, over here, I can you know, keep writing more code also. For example, now this is an array. Right. What if I want to extract an element from the array? So, for instance, I have defined this uh, A and B would be arrays now because I'm squaring all the elements of array B. If I go here, I can say that. Let me say B1. I want B1 to be defined as your one. Right. So, first element of this array B will go here, and then let me do. Uh, C, which is essentially a dot product of A and B. Okay, but this is a logic that you have written in the math script. And you can add all the outputs as required. Add output. How many variables are detected? A, B, B1, and C. These many variables are detected. So what I will do is I'll give B out. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll give A out. Add output, I'll give A as output. Then I'll give B1 as the output. I'll also give C as the output. So I have three input outputs from here now from this block. And I can put an indicator. So this, this becomes an array. This becomes an element. C would be another array. Run this. Sorry, okay. The, this is the input, the first one, and this is the next one, okay. Now, as you can see that I've squared all the elements, retrieve the first element, and a dot product of these two arrays are over here, okay. So this is essentially a simple logic. Now there are more complex examples. So which is why uh, another thing that you can try doing this first thing, but uh, as soon as you're done with this, I want you to also explore the NI example finder, which you get from here, help find examples. It will appear like this. Over here, search for math script. So just to show you a good example, let's go to heat equation VI. It's loading. So this is a, a simple example of how a point, you know, within a 2D plane keeps emanating heat in, in within the 2D plane surface, point temperature being 100 and uh, 
the point size, let's say, being pi, background temperature being 10, this is the temperature scale. So I'll just run the code. You notice that you know this is the point of temperature which is at 100 and background temperature is 10. It's it's just spreading in that manner. But if you go to the block diagram, this is what I wanted to mainly show you that your entire logic over here has been built using various functions using or from the math script node. So now you can see how various pieces are kind of coming together. Okay. You can notice you have a loop, you have math script within that, you have the timing, you have various things that have been brought together. You have arrays. So all of these things have been brought together for your uh, you know, specific application. So in this case, it's a heat, heat equation solution problem. Okay, so uh, you guys, what you can do is finish this first and then explore the heat equation, try to find out the heat equation. Let's finish, try to finish it around 1240 so that you have five minutes for the last uh, portion, which is the modulation tool. We will cover that in detail later anyway, uh, but let's try to wrap up at 1240. Okay, so the, the thing is, um, I think you have to consider this to be a, a, the equivalent to Scilab probably. So the thing is, MathScript um, NI is now very actively collaborating with MATLAB. So there is actually one more thing which is called the MATLAB script. The difference between those two is that MathScript is an inherent function within LabVIEW. Hence, toolboxes are not support, supported. Okay, so there is a difference between MathScript and MATLAB script. In MathScript, toolboxes are not supported. Only the primitive functions are supported, but it follows the MATLAB syntax. Whereas the MATLAB script 
Okay, whereas a MATLAB script actually invokes MATLAB from LabVIEW. Okay, so if you are looking at, let's say, using the SDR to receive the data and use an existing algorithm that you've developed in MATLAB, you can use the MATLAB script and that invokes MATLAB. Hence, all functions that are valid in MATLAB, which is installed on your system, will be valid in MATLAB script, whereas MATH script has primitive functionalities. Toolboxes are not supported. Essentially, that's the main thing. The toolboxes are not supported. Modulation toolkit we will cover in detail as we go along with multiple sessions. Just to quickly, we will be, uh, you know, tomorrow's demonstrations or tomorrow's agenda actually covers that in detail as well. The uh, interfacing, etc. It, it, it gets covered very well. Uh, right now, it's just to show you what it is, what are the various factors that you have to consider, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this, this is the, uh, you know, just like you found all these functions. There is a RF communications toolkit wherein you have access to something called as a modulation toolkit. The modulation toolkit, it has components like, uh, you know, modulation and demodulation functions, right? So if you are trying to do a transmission, you do the modulation component or piece of it, then do the actual transmission. Whereas the demodulation is for receiving a demodulation. The, the toolkit also gives you a lot of uh, additional features. Okay, you can you can do resampling, make a PLL, you can do various measurements. It gets really interesting, slightly more complicated with digital modulation. So you have various, this all of these different modulation schemes that are supported starting from PSK, ASK, PAM, POM, FSK, etc. If you want to do a pure software simulation, it also has the internal, uh, you know, Mathematics supports upconversion. Within demodulation, also you have all these. You have features for bit recovery. You have uh, visualization, various visualization techniques. You have various measurements like bit error rate, etc. We will we will try and uh, you know give I'll try and give you a perspective to this. That is the main objective. So in a very simple manner, for example, you consider if you want to do a PSK based modulation, you will go to modulation. You'll select PSK and you'll drop it. Now, over here, you can notice that this itself has a lot of inputs, like input date bit stream. So you're expected to give a bit stream towards this, various PSK parameters, symbol rates, filter coefficients, etc. Now, how do you work with this function? Again, you have to go back, look at this RF communications uh, modulation toolkit again. Over here, you have various functions that kind of gives you uh, the data required to 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 work with this particular function. So for example, the system parameters, okay The system parameters function, it helps you generate the system parameters for the PSK modulation. So over here, Again, what you need to do is define the PSK type, samples per simple, whether it's differential PSK. Not these things you define, it, it kind of generates a data set that is required. Then what you have is 
filter coefficients. So again, for filter coefficients, there is a separate function, a specific function, which does that job for you. Okay. So pulsating filter coefficients, the transmitter side, you would have to wire it like this. Okay. Again, this function also needs a set of inputs, right? So this, this, <coughs> the the modulation toolkit essentially, you have to look at it as a as a as a combination of a little complicated mathematics. That's it. But the thing is, the modulation toolkit itself, as you can notice or you can see, uh, this is not an exercise. I'll just quickly show you something uh, that you know I have modified from an example. You will be working with these tomorrow. These functions, this function, what you see here, it's a set of or it's a logic that has been built using the modulation toolkit. So over here on the front panel, you see that you have the choice of various PSK format, filter coefficients, constellation, and sampling rate, IQ sampling rate. Now over here, what I'll do is, for example, I've selected QPSK and I'll run the code. So this is the one. Let me go to 16 PSK and run the code. You can notice that accordingly, this the, this, the actual signal is getting generated. Correct? Now, how this, how is this done? You can see that the first function here, I'll enable the context help again. It generates the system parameters. It pushes the data into a sub VI. So someone was asking me about a sub VI, how to generate sub VI. So this is a sub VI, I'm opening it. It looks like this. It gives me a lot of options. And over this sub VI over here, I have a load of data sets coming in. There is some little complicated processing, but essentially, uh, this is a user defined pattern. So after this user defined pattern is done. So look at the last part only this part. Data is generated data is going to the modulate VI, and then there is a filter coefficients VI. So output of that will go towards as a waveform. And this waveform is what gets finally generated if you want to generate this as a signal. This waveform is what finally gets generated. And uh, there is a constellation graph that it gets displayed on. So how to access the constellation graph is another point, which is easy if you do not have access to it. Go to the front panel. There is an RF communications uh, panel there as well. Go to digital, drop in constellation graph. These three functions will come together into a single place, wherein the data can be wired like this. Okay. So the we will be touching upon this in detail if we have time in the evening, which I think we will have. We will go back and revisit this once more. Math script has to be clear to you. Uh, um, covered everything that I had intended to in the morning half. Do you guys have any questions? You can take them. And uh, and also, if anyone is facing any activation level issues, I am we I'm I'm here. We can you know. You can wait till one o'clock or so. If you have any issues, please bring it up. Let's try to sort it. I mean, you can present your screen and you know you can, you can try and uh, sort it out that way. Any questions, anyone? Uh, sir, agenda is at three o'clock, right? Yes, yes. So the next session is at 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. And also currently any one of you is facing problem, you can share your screen with the experts and we will resolve your problem. Any of you, if you want to share your screens or to discuss with us, just raise your hand. Okay, so let me ask uh, one by one to share your screen, please. Uh, just a moment.
Yeah, Aniket, have you have you simulated? Manish Kumar Meena, Paramjit. Please respond yes or no, whatever it is. Asta Sarma, Ashwini Gan, any problem? Yes, uh, Miss, is Dr. Juhi Gupta in the session? She had asked me about the uh, issue. Okay, so Dr. Juhi, can you discuss, please? Hello. Yes, 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 sir. Yeah, ma'am, I just wanted to quickly check with you on that activation uh, issue that you were mentioning. Yeah, yeah. Is that sorted now? Or, uh... No, ma'am. No, sir. It is still, uh, I'm not able to install that. Can you just present your screen, please? We'll just quickly resolve that. And if others are facing the issue, I mean, if you don't mind, if others are facing the issue, probably they can also. IT Jammu participants, those who are for DPE, try to respond for the session. As depending on your performance only, you will get the credits. Otherwise, not. Uh, actually, it is not allowing to share my screen. Uh, the sharing screen is uh, uh, allowed. I think you can allow. You can share now. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's visible, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am, this is uh, not needed. You can just open lab view. You can just open lab view. Now that we have touched upon the initial portion of uh, lab view, uh, I'll quickly you know, take you through a revision. I won't really uh, put anything on the screen, but uh, what I want to do is I want to kind of take you through what all we did, some terms so that uh, you have a recollection of, you know, what all we did. And uh, probably if you have, or if you are not able to do the demonstrations today in the morning or in the exercise today morning along with me, please ensure you do it uh, in the in the evening sometime. Uh, right now, we uh, the afternoon session, it will not have any, um, you know, hands-on as such, it's, it's a theory content. But it's very important again what we'll be touching upon is the hardware level architecture the pure architectural level details of the sdr um uh, morning may what we touched upon is first session we saw lab view we understood what lab view is it's a, it's a graphical design platform uh, that we would be uh, using to work the initial four days of this this workshop the the idea of software defined instrumentation the program it's called a virtual instrument the program has two parts one is a front panel and another one is the block diagram the front panel has or is the is the ui that is where the end user interacts with we took an analogy and compared it with applications uh, mobile applications where the uh, front panel is what you as a user for a mobile application would see 
and the blob diagram is where uh, the the actual program and has written the logic for a program like this so in our case what we have seen is that the interaction with the usrp that actually happens with the block with the block diagram and the interaction of the program with the user it happens through the front pattern so these are the two parts of your uh, program a vi a virtual instrument uh, now within that the front panel we saw what are the various elements that come on a front panel we saw that we have controls and indicators the controls and indicators that we have we saw that uh, controls are the data elements that are used to date, give data into the program and that indicators are the elements that are used to give data out from the program towards the end user so controls we saw various data types over there we saw numeric boolean uh, you know, within numeric itself, integer, floating point, then string data type, enumerated data type. So we saw various data type. Uh, just keep remembering or have a memory of what they are, and in fact, better as to how or where the application scenario kind of fits into. Then we went ahead and touched upon the concept of um, uh, went ahead and touched upon the concept of the block diagram we saw what are the components of the block diagram we saw various functions that are there simple uh, primitive functions we saw sub vis various sub vis that are uh, required uh, sorry sub vis that are there in the program and sub va how you can create also we saw how you can create a new sub vis and when needed and additionally we also saw that the the entire logic uh, it, it kind of can be uh, executed iteratively if we use a programming block called the loop so within the loop we saw two classifications a while loop and a for loop a while loop is a loop that runs in the, you know uh, indefinitely whereas a for loop is a, a loop that runs for a definite exact number of times so we saw a classification there then we saw a structure called the case structure and how sub diagrams can be created in the in the lab software along with how a decision making happens so essentially case structure is uh, you know something that helps you to do uh, decision making a specific kind of decision making which involves a sometimes a user interface based decision making in, in many a times, what happens is these things that we kind of saw independently, everything comes together. So it might happen that the logic that you've written is not just applicable or it's not just, uh, you know, essentially uh, it's, it's just a standalone component. Many of these things kind of integrate together to form. Like, okay, wait Participants, please. Okay, उन्होंने क्रेडिट कोर्स रखा है इसे क्रेडिट कोर्स हां हेलो जो और थर्टी है भाई क्यों कर रहे हो अच्छा पार्टिसिपेंट्स प्लीज म्यूट योरसेल्फ हां किसी <laughs> 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 हेलो अमित सर यू देयर सॉफ्टवेयर डिफेंस रेडियो के बोर्ड आते हैं ना तो एनआई का बोर्ड है यूएसआरपी यहां पे है उसने ट्रेनिंग किया नहीं वो ये किसी को पूछा ना हो क्या बोलते हैं हमारे स्टूडेंट को पूछो फैकल्टी को हां देवर लेवल पे कोई अंदर बोलता है अंदर वो चाय वो चाय आपको बिना Hello. You can mute. Uh, mute. Yes. Yeah. No, I don't have the control. I actually, I'm not actually a host. I'm not a host. Okay. Yeah. Participants, please ensure you mute yourselves uh, when when you know you're not involved in the class. Kindly, it's a request. It's a big disturbance to others as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, as we were seeing, we were talking about the various uh, uh, you know, where are we? Huh. the the 
the whole point that many parts of the logic kind of merges together to form a you know a larger program so essentially these components that we we touched upon or we saw it comes together into a larger program built you know used to develop a larger scale logic that is used for a program that uh, you know you would be working with or the kind of programs that we had seen we would be uh, using them now uh, following that we also touched upon something called as the uh, something called as the math script node we developed an exercise over there as well we saw how math script node can be used to develop uh, uh, M, M script based logic. We also just touched, we didn't do anything. We also just uh, saw something called as a MATLAB script, which can be used to call upon MATLAB from LabVIEW itself to execute the, the program in that uh, environment, MATLAB environment. Finally, we also dealt with the toolkit, the modulation toolkit that would help you uh, in this in these sessions. The modulation toolkits will be covered uh, as we go along and do more exercises tomorrow. Uh, second half is more theoretical. So one request is for all of you, please be a little interactive. Again, uh, afternoon session. Again, you are professor, so you know what the challenges are. Okay. Is the slide visible? Yeah, visible. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So um, coming back now, we'll, we'll uh, continue with the session. Uh, if you have any questions till now, any points on any points till now, we can take it up. Otherwise, I'll continue. Now, participants, any question, any doubt which you want to discuss? Okay. Go ahead, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let's let's go to the hardware architecture. So what we saw in the in the in the uh, initial part of the session, uh, a very basic architecture of what an SDR is. Okay. So we we see a transmitter like this. We see a receiver like this. Now within this receiver. You know, what all parts would be covered by the hardware? What all part would be defined by the software is the first question. So now we are breaking down what we have seen overall architecture. We will break it down into multiple components and some components we will study in detail. So for example, we will look at this. We will kind of separate the various components and we will go and study more details into the IQ architecture of the USRP device. That is how uh, the session is planned out. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, we had seen this already that the initial part or the, the most fundamental part of the SDR is to decide what, what, what part amongst the entire design would be software defined and what would remain onto the hardware, the actual radio platform. The software platform, as you see, the software algorithm, which is essentially hosted on a processor, would do the do the processes like coding, modulation, if there is multiple axis, multiple axis, et cetera. So all of that would get dumped onto the processor. So if you're de developing an OFDM system, let's say, everything including the multiple axis gets implemented at the software level. Then you have the baseband converters, the unlocked digital or digital to unlock converters, following which the final IQ up conversion process, which essentially is the mixing, and the local oscillator, et cetera, that entire part is there in the IQ up converter. So what we do is that, what we see here is that the front end, okay, the front end, which is the actual hardware is software tunable. So this is, pay attention to this, it is tunable, okay? So you have a range, so there are various parameters, we will see this in detail, but right now, just remember that these various parameters of the radio, are tunable and the baseband data you have entire control over from the software platform that you will be using. These are the two parts of the system. Now, the, the various uh, parts or various algorithms for signal processing that we saw, uh, you, would, you would be you know noticing those over here. So your coding, modulation, multiple access, again, demodulation and decoding. All of these things are what is expected to be hosted on a processor. So in this, the 
processor itself, you have two spectrums or you have different options to work with. You have a processor which follows a computer architecture. Okay, so is the advantages here are that you have very good compilation time. So this is very simple. I'm, I'm just talking about, let's say a computer like mine. So, or, or a computer of your, like yours, a simple system, a computer system which runs on a processor. So there are really, uh, you know, not much of uh, compilation challenges. You write up code, you can run it immediately if it is error free, obviously. And you have, you know, uh, programming languages that helps you implement complex algorithms you have, you have operating system supports you have you know floating point processing capability but having said that i mean having you know considered all the advantages that this brings into picture you have certain disadvantages as well when using software which is you know your architecture at the end of the day it remains to be sequential your architecture your amount of parallel processing is is, is uh, at the end of the day, limited to the number of cores the processor uh, has or the processor system has. The architecture, hardware architecture, there is no way of reconfiguring its software system. So there is no architecture level reconfiguration that is possible. And your uh, you know, system itself, it's not deterministic to the pin. So determinism is a term that is used to understand a process as to how on time, the the actual process defined to be completed gets you know finished on time. So if you define an application or a particular program to be finished on 100 milliseconds, it is supposed to finish at 100 milliseconds. So it doesn't mean that you know it should get finished in one millisecond. The main point is that the process itself. So you are the challenge of determinism comes into picture in a processor because like I said, you have too many parallel things happening on a computer system. And this means that your timing of a particular program running might be different, right? I mean, you would have noticed this, that computers are not that predictable in terms of uh, managing the time that you you define at a at a time. So, for example, if I if I define a process, I benchmark it. I say that, hey, right now it is taking only ten seconds. Next time I run that program on a computer, it might take ten point one seconds or ten point two seconds. I mean, that's possible. So that is the that quality of being able to uh, keep on time is called determinism. So processor systems are not deterministic to the pain. The other end which is the FPGA, uh, stands for Field Programmable Gated Array, in case you're not familiar. These are essentially, uh, you know, FPGAs. If you're not familiar, just read up on it. It is essentially, a, a, you know, a cross combination of digital logic gates that, you know, with, with interconnects and uh, disconnects in between. So the, because it's a hardware-based circuitry, because it's a hardware-based circuitry, it is deterministic in nature. It is inherently parallel. The because again you are defining whatever logic you define, it becomes it gets bond. I mean, in in very simple terms, it kind of gets bond onto a chipset as a logic. So it is very equivalent to the functioning or a lot of advantages that an application specific IC has. The FPGA also will have. It has high throughput, again due to the architecture itself. But there are negatives to this. Right, there are large compilation times. Implementation of complex algorithms is really difficult. And programming languages that are used to work with this are also you know, difficult to learn and in fact, a bit complicated. So the uh, idea is that the processor system, right? The processor itself, it, if it's possible, to bring the best, so the the processor subsystem that you're referring to, that we are referring to in this case, if it is possible to merge the elements, the advantages of both together into a single world, that is what, you know, that is what the best architecture would look like. So if you can bring the CPU and an FPGA together, that 
would essentially you know make it the best device level architecture so now why is pgs for sdr as we have seen whatever advantages we saw it it gives you high throughput processing low latency decision making very high superb determinism and as well as reprogrammable logic so you have again you bring in certain advantages and you use that advantages and you use them when you require these as features to the program that you're developing so if if you are developing an application i'll give certain instances as we go along with the session if you if you need to implement or do an application that 100% requires you to do a high throughput processing and a low latency decision making let's say if you want to ensure something gets done in in a certain couple certain couple of milliseconds maybe operating system based logic is not your best way to go go with it or approach it that is where fpgas for sdrs come into picture right so we have seen this in the morning the multi processor subsystem which is cpu or general purpose processor the gpp stands for general purpose processor which is uh, you know clubbed with an fpg or a dsp sometimes even these fpgs are fixed functionalities so that's that's also you know a possibility but the point is you have a multi processor subsystem that runs uh, to generate the baseband data generate or receive the baseband data you have the baseband converters which brings the uh, you know digital if it the data is digital so in a transmitter you bring the digital data to analog nature whereas if it is a receiver you have analog to digital and then you have the rf front end so we have seen this we seen how the usrp is this is the first version this is a host only usrp wherein the programming logic the program is written using uh, the labview software there is no programmable fpga on this you control the host many things are tunable but here you are missing out on certain uh, high uh, data intensive or high processing intensive application scenarios which require that level of high throughput or low latency decision making so the the next type of sdr which has a programmable fpga it it typically it has higher data bandwidth capabilities it has better features it has better rs specifications but the main differentiator the main differentiating factor here is the programmability of the fpg itself so the the architecture here what you see uh, an additional um, i don't i wouldn't say an advantage as such but an additional feature or additional thing that you see in this usrp is that here this usrp the host based usrp it has just two channels one transmitter and one receiver whereas in the usrp rio all the ones available in the market they have two channels each so two transmitters and two receivers okay so the product range is varied i mean you generally look at the type of applications that you want to work with that application will help you or tell you uh, help you define what is the type of hardware that you will be working with so regarding this if you want to have any specific discussions you can reach out to us reach out to the team we will help you with it but the point that i'm trying to drive is that it is you know simply not just uh, uh, you know limited to uh, ni the platform whatever we are covering we are using one of the platforms one of the tools but it is not really limited there you have various tools like the gnu radio software software environments like python matlab c c++ etc to work with these usrp devices so you have options which uh, you want to you know always evaluate to look at the advantages and disadvantages of each of them so i'll not go into details of this the comparison or a trade off analysis but I'm saying there is always a choice and uh, understanding that choice depending on what are your requirements are is important when taking a decision on the usrp so let's let's look at the host only usrp first so this is the one this is the device uh, on which i had the recording session as well now on this 
this is the device level architecture we will come to this uh, more in detail as we uh, proceed with the sessions but what i want you to understand here is that as the device gets more and more complicated okay this is the reconfigurable option essentially the one with a programmable fpga you can notice that the device design has become slightly more complicated you have more components you have more switches you have more uh, even rf uh, components and this is just a single channel okay now as we go along for military grade or deployable applications there are standalone sdr so these things are big these things are like really uh, you know powerful it has an i7 processor it has a computer on board of the system itself so even these are new type of designs where you say that hey i have the two parts of the processor of system but why can't my computer sit on my usrp itself so these are standalone usrp used for very high grade defense military applications uh, amal uh, so in case of standalone usrp uh, what are the technical specifications such as how much is the maximum power limit how much is the frequency range as of now this model is concerned 2974 okay. yeah yeah so the 2974 the frequency range specifications are uh, limited to 50 megahertz to 6.6 gigahertz mm -hmm. and the the device itself uh, power ranges are also not really that high i have to refer to the specification sheet to get that but in typical applications uh, you know what can be done is a uh, um, uh, amplifiers attenuators etc can be used to handle the power if required in the front end in the front end these are standard sma connectors mm -hmm. 50 ohm impedance matching so mm -hmm. we have actually as a company we have we have uh, designed an amplifier for for a specific customer application that was for a you know in navy antenna for a specific mm -hmm. antenna we had actually designed an amplifier when it was needed so that is compatible it works as well okay okay please carry on and uh, in fact the, there are more of these coming specifically in the higher frequency ranges but you know there are no official documentations out yet but ni is working very actively uh, specifically because uh, people are also now more interested in frequency ranges like 26 gigahertz etc and is also pushing and uh, by uh, you know next month or so there will be one more device i think that almost pushes this to nearly 12 or 12 gigahertz or so and by next year uh, beginning i think there are more device versions that are announced or that are you know planned for which you in uh, millimeter wave range in india some models yes exactly by end of this year millimeter wave uh, models are in in plan okay so ni is working on that uh, i mean we can take it offline in that discussion if there sure, are specific sure. requirements we can take that discussion offline sir because i have also have to involve the correct parties to share the information with you and i has to approve and then we can discuss that discuss on that so as the device gets you know more complicated like i said you have a controller now these controllers itself have you know additional connectivity options you i mean the, the working mode is that you connect a monitor and a, the cpu uh, sorry monitor mouse keyboard etc to this usrp itself to kind of program it so it's an i7 controller which you can program to be in a deployable nature as well and these are uh, you know essentially made for military aerospace applications but <coughs> sorry let's look at something which is very specific and very very much required for our application so the fundamental piece of an sdr is iq architecture so the iq modulator so how data is generated in lab view we saw or we spoke about a complex data type in the morning so in the complex data type we saw that you know we 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 uh, you know discussed that complex data type it has a real and imaginary component so over here what happens from lab view as as we generate a data to be transmitted we actually generate a data in this complex double form that gets taken towards the hardware in an iq format so we will see this using some mathematical equations a little later 
you have uh, again various forms or different structures possible of this this is a homodyne architecture there is a single stage of up conversion there are architectures where there are multiple stages of up conversion so you bring it to an if an intermediate frequency and then you bring it to an rf so these are various you know hardware level design options that you have again most of this is kind of abstracted out for you you don't really have a lot of control and uh, you know a lot of what do you say know how also unless and until you go back and study this well you you will not realize that it's a multi stage up conversion or down conversion but these are two different architectures one is homodyne one is heterodyne essentially what is expected out of the various components right in the transmitter and receiver chain look at it very carefully this is a i mean this is kind of summarizing what we uh, talked about before that your basic components of the sdr one is the processor subsystem another one is the rf transceiver so the processor fpga combination it is expected to do the modulation digital up conversion and signal processing whereas the front end talking about the transmitter whereas the front end is expected to do digital to analog conversion and the rf up conversion so the sdr the hardware piece it does the uh, Uh, digital to analog conversion rf conversion whereas the the processor system it takes care of the modulation and signal processing whereas the in the receiver the i mean it just reverses you have demodulation digital down conversion and signal processing happening on the processor fpga combination of the receiver and the rf down conversion and analog to digital conversion happening on the uh, rf transceiver of the receiver chain so this is where the modulation toolkit kind of comes into play you talk about the software piece of it how the implementation is so the modulation toolkit it has functions to help you implement you know even uh, pn sequence generation uh, your model the so codings so source coding channel coding various modulation schemes you can introduce impairments into the system if needed Uh, up conversion would be uh, done over there if you are doing a simulation you can do channel models you can implement channel models also in the software using the toolkit so this is this is your modulation toolkit and every other process i mean the down conversion demodulation filtering equalization decoding and finally after the reception things like dr measurements as well as constellation plotting can be done on the using the modulation toolkit now if the moment you bring it to the hardware platform this gets replaced by the usrp hardware and the the device itself it essentially receives data in a complex double form okay in a complex double form from the hardware uh, from the software which can be taken uh, whatever digital processing is on which is whatever analog mixing exercise there on the device it does that and it gets transmitted over an antenna over an sma port so there are various uh, you know uh, points or various uh, areas of research that you typically would see so i'll not go uh, into that in detail actually but we will quickly uh, you know run through some some cases or run through some uh, examples codes etc as you would see this is a qom transmitter so what you would see in this what what part falls into the rf front end and what parts uh, falls into the cpu can be seen and you have uh, you know a, a basic iq mapping which we will see later in in the next part of the session just to quickly help you understand the requirement of an fpg so the the application an application like cognitive radio which requires very low latency decision making right this is an example of how or why an fpga would fit into the sdr device architecture so the moment you are saying that a high speed spectrum sensing and switching is required and needed to be done that is something that can be dumped onto the fpga the, the for the pure reason that the application that is written on the fpga typically has very high throughput 
and decision making is quite fast i mean you have low latency decision making or even in full duplex systems a logic like digital cancellation where the processing has to be done within very low uh, latency you have or you have the advantage of the fpga on the usrp platform okay so in a similar way you have uh, you know the various applications that come up in 5g so i'll not go into those in detail uh, i'll quickly show you a simple fact a simple pointer uh, in the usrp uh, device architecture on how the synchronization is done so now the usrp device architecture itself you have uh, like we said you have a transmitter and a receiver and other than that there are some terminals that we have okay the most important ones that we should know about are these reference and pps so the usrp it has an oscillator okay it has an oscillator which is what generates your rf carrier frequency now the rf carrier frequency uh, you know it gets generated by the oscillator based on a pulse per second signal and a reference frequency which is 10 megahertz now this two signals even if whatever you have are very high precision oscillators these high precision oscillators are you know built in such a way that you know there is some ppm of error right there is some because it's essentially it's a hardware component there is some ppm of error on the device itself uh, on the oscillator the clocks itself hence the oscillator also will have an amount of uh, uh, you know challenge phase coherence and that is what gets solved by an architecture which can be used to share these clocks across different devices so typically when you are going for an application like let's say massive mime or even a mimo based application you want your channels to be phase coherent and for you to ensure that is done for you to ensure that is done the phase coherency part is done you have to uh, you know share these two signals from a common signal source from a common signal source towards these usrps which gets shared through a device called the octo clock i'm just giving a perspective over here that you know as you scale up all these kind of architectures is possible all these kind of architectures are possible by using the the usrp device now okay uh, amal just to uh, go more a little bit into discussion mm -hmm. let's say if uh, since we have the basic uh, students also under grade mm -hmm. like second third year and fourth year mm -hmm. so let me put up the a question like this way mm -hmm. so let's say by using our hdr kit or usrp if mm -hmm. i have to generate an fm signal or am signal of 2.4 gigahertz mm -hmm. now just in layman language that uh, how much signal in terms of frequency and bandwidth will be feeded softwarely as well as in analog manner to that usrp or will this operation will be completely performed in software then it will be just to feed it as a data point in cpu just to form the kind of the waveforms or partially the same age software that is some uh, some simulation some data points and partially by using hardware so how the complete working will be done right sir so that uh, this session will actually cover that so if if the you know question remains after that we can you know pick it up probably following that the session this this part this part of the session is actually going into the iq architecture itself oh, so once we, uh, once we cover that if the question still you know uh, lingers we can take it up following that sure right so what we saw in this part of the lecture was the the 
the multiprocessor subsystem which involves both the cpu and the fpga and why both of the components are sometimes needed and in certain what kind of applications it might be needed so now we are coming back we are looking at a single part or a single part of the entire architecture which is the hardware device and within the hardware device how the iq architecture gets implemented so this is your uh, usrp hardware uh, you know schema as as you see now this one i will spend some time i'll discuss this in detail uh, so over here over here we have let me just put this to a laser pointer okay so over here you look at this one part what you see on the top so this is the transmit chain of the usrp so starting with the system the computer which generates the uh, you know digital base band so at the moment just consider that this part uh you know generates the digital baseband we will come back and revisit this part by part again but over here the system generates a digital baseband and that signal through a digital up conversion process arrives at the digital to analog converters from over there this particular usrp device which of which the schema is on the schematic is on the slide this is the ni2920 it's a device that has a bandwidth of 20 megahertz so the 20 megahertz bandwidth is you know this 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 there is a low pass filter that limits the signal at 20 20 megahertz over here you have a mixer towards which the carrier frequency comes from the pll vco combination so this is your local oscillator post the mixer you have a transmit amplifier that defines the power of the final signal that is transmitted so if you notice from over here your signal is purely analog in nature so after the dac your signal is purely analog in nature local oscillator also generates an analog data and finally you have an rf switch so we will come to the switch part later but at the moment understand that this is the transmit chain and your signal arrives at the transmit terminal which is the which is the uh, uh you know sma connectivity port now the in a similar manner look at the receive chain you have the receiver port sma again you have an lna drive amplifiers again you have the local oscillator mixers filters adcs after the adc digital down conversion and then receiving of signal towards the system and the connectivity in this particular case is done using a gigabit ethernet port i mean this varies the type of connectivity varies otherwise essentially the the main core architecture that you see over here it remains the same or remains common across all the usrp devices that you typically work with so let's let's go to uh, understanding the iq architecture specifically now the 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 actual rf front end uh, what is the iq architecture and what signals are being generated from the computer system like this exact question that sir was asking we'll we'll go into that so your signal the the basic of this entire thing is the concept of two orthogonal data streams that are being generated which gives you a phase modulated signal at the end so let me break that down let me bring it in terms of uh, you know mathematics okay so we have a system like this wherein we will go back now let's consider an rf signal look at this rf signal for any kind of modulation to take effect what all do we control so we have these three parameters right we have the amplitude we have the frequency we have the phase so these are the these these are the three parameters that we typically would like to control by using or while modulating a signal so what you see here that equation a cos 2 pi fct plus phi is a general representation of an rf signal and what we want to vary are a fc and phi 
okay and this is is the uh, quick refresher for you know people who are just familiar with this you have you see how amplitude modulation is how frequency modulation is how phase modulation is what we see is that a fc and phi are the parameters varied now this is a quick math that essentially breaks the equation the rf original rf signal if you apply this uh, equation on to that uh, rf signal what do you get you break down of course alpha plus beta you arrive here and what is done in 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 practice is that you bring in this a cos phi and a sin phi and call it i and q components so the i stands for in phase and q stands for quadrature and from over there you arrive at a new equation your original signal which was a cos 2 pi fct plus phi it is equivalent to your a cos phi becomes i now so i cos 2 pi fct plus q sin 2 pi fct so these are the uh you know these two equations are now equivalent now let's let's try and understand you know what are the components that remain your original variables of the signal which were a fc and phi now has become the three new variables be has become i q and fc so your signal which had one amplitude one frequency and one phase component as variable ha now has two amplitudes and one frequency component now inherently what is the advantage in this or why why follow an architecture like this your typical uh, systems which involve amplitude variation right it's it's easy to develop your your if you are even if you are not thinking of a software system let's look at a very a uh, very traditional hardware based architecture or hardware system also you vary an amplitude by varying you know by by having a attenuator or an amplifier in place i mean you can you can vary the amplitude of a signal in a, a very easy manner frequency also you have a voltage control oscillator you can keep varying the frequency of a signal that you are trying to generate so fc is also variable but typically something like a phase shifter in a rf circuitry okay it turns turns out especially when you want to have different phi values it turns out to be a you know not so feasible solution so what you do is you take that you take that phi value and you merge it with the a value to bring in two amplitude components now so you have a cos phi becomes that becomes i and a sin phi that becomes q which both of them are amplitudes if you look at the equation you can very very clearly notice that both of them are amplitudes right so what comes from lab view your signals that come from lab view this output of modulation toolkit itself from lab view you have the i and q data arrays that come from the labview software so over here towards the digital to analog converter the the first digital to analog converter you have the i data array and towards the q digital to analog converter you have the q data array now if you look back to the original signal sorry original slide just go back now if you go back to the original architecture you can notice that you have two lines right two separate lines each of them one of them carrying the i data the next one carrying the q data right so this is the actual usrp architecture
Now, what is the IQ architecture or what is it? I'll uh, sh show this to you on a you know, software, uh, on the software itself. This, what you see over here, this is your data. Okay, this is your signal on a complex plane. You bring it to, let's say, a phase like this. So the green line that you notice over here, this indicates your A and phi. So your A angle phi is, phi is denoted by the green line over here, which this is the polar notation. You can see that. Now the, the moment you are bringing it to an IQ notation, this <clears throat> one one angle point for add, it becomes 0 0.871 plus 0.491i. So in lab view, this is essentially a complex data type. We saw in the morning that complex data types are a specific numerical data type that is available within lab view. Now, just pay attention as I am varying this, you can notice that the phaser, it's, it's, it's changing position and your rectangular notation and uh, the, the phi, as the phi value is varying, the, recta, the rectangular notations, i and q components, the in-phase in -phase and quadrature components keep varying. Just to make it, you know, more interesting, you can see this as you are, you know, doing the rotation. What this means is represented over there in the indicators below, right? So over here, as you are at zero of zero phase, the signal as can be noticed is with zero uh, phi. So this part actually has the in-phase component as the, the exact same amplitude as the RF signal. And as you are changing the phase, you're at this particular phase, these are the projected you know, values or projected uh, terms points on the graph across both the x and y axis and hence the in phase component which is the which is the cost component would that would be projected over here is at this particular amplitude which is 0.518 and the quadrature amplitude is at 0.855 okay so this is how it you know varies the in phase and quadrature component as you can notice this keeps you know fluctuating as we go along. So what does means to us is that if I am doing it the other way around also, meaning right now what I was doing is I was varying the phase, keeping the amplitude constant, and I was showing you that the inference and quadrature components they do vary in that manner, in that order. But what if I want to generate these two amplitudes and then vary the phase, which is what happens when you try and work with this rectangular mode, okay? So you have these two now, you have the in-phase and quadrature components, the i and q data that you are varying. So let's say you for, for the ease, let's bring both of them at nearly zero, okay? Now let's try to change the q component to an extent and then i also to that extent. So instead of using the polar notation, I am generating or I am capable of generating two separate signals now, okay? So previously what was happening, pay very close attention here. Previously what was happening is that your, the signal itself, which was A cos two pi FCT plus phi, I was varying A and phi, to get the values of i and q. But now, this was just to show you that they are equivalent. But now in my implementation, what I'm doing differently is that I am saying, hey, I have or I have the ability to generate two amplitudes, okay? What if I add these two waveforms? Will I get a signal which can have both amplitude and phase variation? 
So as you notice, I have arrived at a specific rectangular notation value and I have reached one angle 0.49 rad for polar notation. Now, if I want to achieve another value, all I need to do is keep changing the Q values or the I values. Now, this is the most fundamental piece, the most fundamental, uh, you know, working part of the USRP device. The USRP device is based entirely on this. And You know, the the more number of uh, I ang uh, sorry A angle phi you want to achieve, you have various uh, I and Q values that are used or that can be used to generate this. Now let's take a look back at one of the examples or one of the exercises that we were doing in the morning. Give me a second So we had seen a part of this in the morning. So we saw this much part of the code in the morning where we said that this function is what generates the complex waveform. You can see if you can see my mouse pointer. We saw that we discussed that this part is what generates the actual complex waveform. So if you look at this function, let me open this up now. Again, I don't want to the whole new. So look at the last piece of this, this logic, wherein this modulate function, the modulate function, you can notice generates something called as an output complex waveform. So the output complex waveform, it contains various uh, components or in which contains the information about the signal. So this is where I would introduce you to something uh, introduce you to a small concept uh, really as to what all are the components that are required to be stored in a complex waveform so let me minimize this let me come back here this is your complex waveform and these are the various components as you see you have three parts to it okay three parts to it the first one okay can, can anyone you know Take a guess or take a shot at this. If you look at a complex waveform, okay, you know that leave complex right now. Okay, leave complex. You look at any waveform. You are you are trying to record the data, and you want to let's say play it back or you want to just analyze the data. What all components of the signal would you record? What is the essential components in the digital domain? Of course, when you're trying to save a waveform in the digital domain. What all components of the signal would you would you record? Anyone? Amplitude, phase, and frequency. Okay, but it is a time varying signal. It's not a it's not a periodic signal. Only the amplitude. Okay, so amplitude is needed, of course. What else? How do you how do you acquire the data? Sampling. Yeah, you sample it. Correct. So when you sample it, what information do you want if you want to do an analysis on the data? Sampling frequency. Precisely. So you need the sampling frequency, which is uh, in a way what we record is the delta t, the time interval between the samples. So you want to uh, record all the amplitude values. So if you keep, let's say, sampling at an interval of 100 hertz, I'm just, just putting a number there. 
if you're trying to uh, if you want to sample at the rate of 100 hertz you have that uh, data set of let's say you do do a sampling only for one second so you now have a data set that is an array of 100 data points then the delta d value which is essentially storing the information about the sampling rate so if you have uh, the the sampling rate that is 100 hertz uh, which would be uh, 10 milliseconds so that 10 milliseconds would be the delta t value okay so you have the the array of data which is y you have the sampling rate which is i mean the dt value and also you in, in certain applications, there is a requirement to understand which is the, what is the time stamp at which the waveform actually started. So which is called the T0. So the time corresponding, the absolute time, the absolute time corresponding to the first sample. Okay. So these three components kind of come together into a data type called the waveform. So this is the first concept. Now within the waveform itself, whatever we discuss now, it follows an IQ architecture. Now, the moment it follows an IQ architecture, like I said, it has both I and Q components. So your data type, the array of data Y, it would be now in a format which is I plus JQ. So now let me go back to this thing that we had done in the morning. Let me drop a numeric constant. Within the representation, I have something called as a complex double. So you notice how I have two parts to this, wherein I can define an in, define the in-phase component, the I component, the real component, and the complex component, which in our case is a quadrature component. So you have, just to give a simple instance, 0 0.707 and 0 0.707. So this is how a complex number would look like. Now, if you, let's say, uh, are generating a series of, if you're generating a waveform, a single data point is not enough. So then what will happen is you have an array like this into which you would store all the, you would have all the data points, each element being an element in the array of the data. Uh, array of in each element in the array which stores the data so in our case this would be the y okay your dt would be let's say uh, any number let's say something like point zero one now, where am I seeing here? What am I seeing? Uh, where am I seeing this in this in this block diagram is over here. The data that is getting generated out of the ESK generate VI. This has that components. As you can notice over here, I don't know how visible it is. You have various components, which are the T0, DT, and Y. And this is where I would like you to, you know, get familiar with one more, uh, you know, LabVIEW concept, which is called the cluster. The cluster is nothing but an, a data structure that is a group of multiple elements, which could be of different data types. So we saw arrays in the morning. We saw that we said that hey, it is a data type. It is the same data that is, uh, you know, there are multiple instances of the same data. Whereas in a cluster, you are allowed to have different data types which can be grouped together. Now each of this, just to, you know, kind of give you an, uh, you know, show this to you separately. Let me break this.
Let me bring it to a new VI. Okay, these are the three different components that you would normally see in a waveform data type. And this data type, the actual waveform data type, in this, in our case, it has been made into a cluster, which is a group or a combination of elements which are of the different data type. Now let's go back here. Let's try to quickly just run this code. You have to understand that this USRP is, uh, you know, not connected on my system, hence. This won't work, but, and we are not, you know, touching upon this at the moment, this will be covered tomorrow. I am just trying to show you how the data is generated in the software and how it would typically interface with the IQ architecture. So over here, your data set, it gets generated from, from over here. So I will create an indicator to this. And I'll run the code. This will throw an error because it will not work. But now I have obtained a waveform. So just to show you how it looks like, we'll bring it back to the first program. Delete all these. Make this a tag bigger. I'll close this. Okay. Now the cluster, the cluster, I have a, I have a way of retrieving the data from the cluster, which is what I have done. These three elements are part of my cluster, which you see over here, this is grouped together. So if I run this now, you can actually notice that these are, this is my sampling rate information. The T0 is given as zero. So it's not really taking in a T0 value right now. And this is my, waveform, the actual waveform that I'm working with. If we need to look at another data data set, we can come back here and try and uh, change parameters over here within this diagram itself. This is a palm TX. What I can do is I can try and generate another uh, data set just to give you perspective. This would generate a PSK data. We just quickly delete this. Create an indicator over here. This is the complex waveform again. Same thing. We'll run the code now. This is for 8 PSK. So for my 8 PSK, the moment I am generating my uh, code, after I'm generating my code and I'm running the VI, this is the data set that has been generated, the actual complex waveform. Just to break it down, I'm bringing it back to my original code, I'm replacing this guy. So you can notice I have this complex waveform now that has been that was generated for representing representing an 8 PSK. And this data set, it's it's quite huge, in fact. So if you 
you just enable a vertical scroll bar, you can see that this is my data set. So essentially what happens is, coming back to the architecture once more, So now think back, essentially what happens is that to generate this A cos 2 pi FCT plus phi, you are making this I cos 2 pi FCT uh, plus Q sin 2 pi FCT, wherein from the software, these two waveforms, which are the I and Q are being generated and they are generated in a form where they are generated in a form where you have both i and q merged together in a complex integer, complex floating point number rather, and within the uh, hard the so within the hardware these go into two separate streams as i and q data array towards the digital to analog converter. So that is directly coming from the LabVIEW software as a complex data array. Cluster, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly spend five minutes on cluster then. I did not cover it because you were rushed on time. So what is a cluster? So we saw how arrays were created in the morning. So uh, the array, this is the array. This is how arrays get created. Okay. Whereas cluster are, is another type of data container wherein I'm allowed to have different data brought together okay. and each of this data can be of different data types. So you can notice that the data type that I have brought in together now, it has numeric, it has Boolean and it has string. I brought them together to form this sample cluster. Now, if you take this cluster, you have various features to kind of retrieve data and put data back onto the cluster. You have cluster functions on the block diagram are available over here. This function. We just enable context help, control H, context help. <clears throat> this function is called unbundle by name. So the moment you wire a cluster to this, it lists out what elements are available or you can expand this as well. So that if you want to retrieve or get access to all the data elements, which is what I had done over Then over here, so I have taken that complex data, uh, complex cluster, and retrieved all the elements using this function, which is unbundled by name. And I can create indicators to this. In a similar way, if I want to kind of merge data elements back together also, I have uh, you know functions which are bundling. So if you want to bundle these elements together, only if you want to bundle just two of these elements together, then you can bundle those. You create a new cluster which has only two elements. But if you want to kind of uh, ensure that you are using the exact same cluster to put the data back, then you would use this function called bundle by name give the reference of the original cluster here like this and then replace whatever is needed. Let's say you want to take this number, increment it by one. And to display it, just quickly rearrange the front panel so that it looks a little cleaner.
these are just the whatever you see outside these are independent elements these ones are independent elements which are part of the cluster itself and this is actually the output cluster which the data replaced and this is the input cluster so let me just give data like for boolean true and on string test i'll run the code now you can notice that these are the exact same elements that you see over here in the output cluster because i had retrieved an element it had added 1 to it incremented it by 1 and brought its value to 5 so 5 boolean true and test okay so to correctly answer your question it is very similar to a structure it's very similar to a structure in c language uh this is that you know in in our case we use it to merge or kind of keep these data points these three data points in our case to kind of keep three these three data points together the, the t0 info the dt info and the y info so it this helps us to kind of bring all these three data points together in a single bundle okay this is the cluster so is this clear is the, is this is this entire thing clear so any questions in this to look back at this have a clear cut understanding of what you know what i was discussing till now so you look at the iq architecture part this is this piece wherever my mouse is hovering right now this is the iq architecture part and this is your you know transmit control the actual computer system the multiprocessor subsystem rather and this is the uh, amplifier switch and the R the sma port which towards which you would connect the antenna any questions in this no looks fine okay now sir did i answer your question what are whatever you are yeah so be better to ask from students okay okay i think in my opinion it's fine okay okay uh, there is one question from uh, shravan shravani is there okay. any reason why the adc and dac specifications are different okay so um these devices they they this is just part of the design there is no specific reason one point that i can you know probably call out here is that whatever these are the filter is essentially limited at 20 megahertz so the bandwidth consideration will anyway be limited at that range and this numbers they are just the design uh, design perspective of it additional an additional point which uh, you know <clears throat> i can bring up now is that the dac or the adc this these would always work at these sampling rates meaning even if let's say you define the device to work at let's say a, a frequency like as a sampling rate or the term is iq rate if you define an iq rate let's say like a 1 mega samples per second also what happens is that these dacs sorry i mean let's let's consider the consider it from the adcs so let's say you define uh, this to work at 1 mega samples per second the adc would continue working at 100 mega samples per second the output now whatever you have your data would be having 100 mega samples per a second of uh, time time interval but what you demanded as in the programmer what you demanded was at one so you bring this you kind of decimate the data in the fpga so even if your fpga is non programmable the dsps that are been that has been programmed onto that the logic blocks that has been programmed onto that it kind of does uh you know down sampling of the data towards 
this one mega samples per second and then it pushes the data over towards the computer system over the transmit whatever the uh, receive control or the, the chain is whatever the communication chain is which in our case is an ethernet okay so relook at this you have the transmit chain you have both i and q chains at the mixer you have the local oscillator date that that keeps generating the carrier frequency which is fc so the fc gets defined from here fc gets defined from here i gets defined q gets defined so i and q gets defined both from the software as i plus jq components comes to the mixer there is a phase shifter there is a fixed phase shifter here one is at zero degree one is at 90 degree this is the cause component this is the sign component so this output from this so let me go back to the this one so the output from this okay we are looking at the transmitter so the output from this okay would be in in such a way that this this i that comes along with this would get merged with the cos phi component gets added over here and then transmitted what is this this is the i data the array i array this is the cos 2 pi fct coming so i cos 2 pi fct which get generated from this mixer 90 degree shift this is the sine component this is the q sine 2 pi fct comes over here it's added and that is the final rf signal which is essentially your this equation this is your final iq architecture which is the basic part of a usrp as we have seen it okay there is just a final part of it there is just a final part of this that has to be covered which is your uh, you know tunable part so what we have seen till now is the hardware level architecture now from the architecture as i mentioned in the beginning of the session you have two sets of uh, tunability or two sets of variability that you have in a software defined radio one is completely defining the baseband the second one is the tunability of certain rf parameters or tunability of certain parameters that are there in the sdr so you don't you don't really program it only you will just tune it okay so the the tunability that's the set of tunable parameters are you know available here on these uh, on this this um, from the schematic we can kind of try and identify these uh, tunable parameters. So the, 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 the biggest or the most important one, for example, is the local oscillator. So like I mentioned in the morning, the local oscillator, it, I mean, you set a frequency. So in the demonstration that you, that you saw in the morning, we were setting a one gigahertz. We were saying that, hey, I want to transmit at one gigahertz. So the local oscillator can be tuned from the program to generate a frequency that the hardware supports. So the, the USRP that we have we're working with, it is limited from, let's say, 50 megahertz to 2.2 gigahertz. I'm just giving an instance. So the that is a hardware level limitation. So any range that you want to work with in that specific uh, you know, um, any any value that you want to work with in that specific range, you would give that as an input towards the USRP uh, device. How do you do that? Again, that is a separate part. Right now, just understand that this is a tunable parameter. So in such a manner, when you're seeing the schematic, do you see any other 
uh, tunable parameters what other tunable parameters would you be you know see uh, would would there be if you are looking at a schematic like this just take a look try to understand What are the parameters that you would ideally want to know? vary? Anyone? Okay, yeah, yeah. So we are varying FC. We are using the local oscillator. Good. We will we will control the local oscillator. We will control the FC carrier frequency. What else? What are what are the other parameters that can be probably controlled? Yeah, amplitude. So what 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 would you what would you control to change the amplitude? Yeah, correct. Power, the, 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 the power at which this transmit amplifier or let's say the receive amplifier, they function. So that is another component. That is another tunable component. What else? What about your sampling rates, the IQ rates? You want to control that? All right. So you want to control the sampling rates from the, of let's say the IQ rates rather, of the ADC or the DAC. So that is another parameter. Okay. The the other two, uh, I mean that's not you know, that that critical as it is. So I'll just uh, call it out. The other two, one is the device identifier. I mean, this is again not an RF specific thing, or this is not a very, you know, uh, conceptual thing as it is. But you are trying to work with any any instrument that you're connecting to a computer. You are uh, typically a computer requires a device identifier. When you are working with a, a working with any kind of people who work with any kind of device would be familiar with this that. There is a device identifier for that device. In this case, in the USRB, for example, you connect it with an Ethernet port. Yes, drivers are required. Precisely, drivers are definitely needed. Uh, my point is that all these tunable parameters, what I was trying to drive towards is the fact that all these tunable parameters that you're referring to, they are controlled from the drivers. And the baseband is actually built or the developed using the modulation toolkit or other mathematical logic that you would be implementing or math script, let's say. Okay, so the tunable parameters are controlled by using the drivers. So based on the time availability, we will uh, uh, we will cover that also. But what I'm coming to is a simple fact that even if you have the drivers installed, let's say the device is detected to, the device will typically have an identifier, some name, so if it's a uh, Ethernet, you'll have an IP address that you are trying to, or that you can use to connect towards that device. If it is a uh, you know a USB based device, then there is a there is another identifier. I mean that will have a name which you can or you have to use in fact to connect to the device. And then you have the RF uh, front end. At the RF front end, there is a there is a switch that we have not discussed till now. So the RF switch, it gives the uh, user of the system a capability to, okay, let me just bring in the, we're not able to, one second. Huh?
Okay, I'm not able to bring in the laser pointer, but I think I hope you can see the mouse pointer. So this this RF switch is what is your objective? So you have this part, the top part, which is the transmit chain, and the bottom part, which is the receive chain. Now, what if I am following an architecture where my I'm following an architecture where my transmit and the receive antenna it has to be the same. So, in very you know simple terms, I want to use some kind of a time division, uh, you know, duplexing in this uh, in this system. In that case, you have the option of listen. You have the option of having this antenna port. So let me just bring in bring up the USRP diagrams also. You can notice that what you see over here on the left, this is RX1 and TX1, whereas the other port is the RX2. So what I'm seeing is the RX1 TX1 is defined in such a way that the RF switch itself, it gives us that capability to use the same uh, you know, port or the same connector for the transmitter chain as well as the receive chain. Okay. So the RF switch is another parameter that will get controlled, but it doesn't work like that actually. What you have to do, the tunability, what you have to do is change the antenna name that you will be using for a specific application. So for example, transmit may, you always have to go with TX1. When it is a receive, you will be using either RX1 or RX2, depending upon how you would want to work with the device. Typically, the expectation is that you work with TX1 for transmitter and RX2 for receiver. Okay. So this question of what all the USRP will ask you is what we answered now. So the first one is the device identifier, the device name, the IQ rate, which is uh, the synonym or the term that we use for the sampling rates, the carrier frequency, the antenna choice, the gain, there is one more parameter, which is the device buffer. So there is a, there is again a, a concept of buffered uh, acquisition, for example, that uh, we need to kind of get our uh, grip on before going into the device driver architecture. So the buffered acquisition, what happens is your device, I mean, the, the, the device itself, you are defining an IQ rate. You are saying that, hey, I'm going to sample at the rate of 100 or, or one mega samples per second. Now this one mega samples per second implies that your uh, data that is coming in, you have a new sample every one microsecond. These data points, which are getting generated once every microsecond is not getting transmitted onto the computer immediately. These data points, they, uh, they're getting stored on the hardware device itself as a device buffer. So onto the device, there is a memory. And onto the memory, these data is getting, this data is getting queued up one by one. As, as, as you're getting these samples, once in this case, I'm, I'm going with that example of one mega samples for this conversation, entire conversation. So if you look at uh, if a data point getting generated every one microsecond, that data point will get queued onto the USRP device buffer. Now, from the USRP device buffer, this data has to be taken and brought onto the LabVIEW software. So when you're talking about the acquisition, the receiving, uh, receiving option, the RF receive, what happens is you take a bulk of this data. So you are sampling once every one microsecond, but data does not got, uh, you know, does not, data is not brought from the, uh, the device towards the computer every one microsecond. 
that interval is longer so let's say let's say that you want to get data from the computer sorry the device towards the computer once uh, every 100 millisecond so in that case in 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 our situation what we will do is we will say that hey what i will do what we will do is we will bring 100000 samples okay 100000 samples so remember the terms numbers that i'm using i said i am using 1 mega samples per second of sampling rate now within that i am bring i'm planning to bring in 100 thousand samples from the device buffer towards the computer buffer okay so which means that every one tenth of a second look at the math one mega samples per second 100 kilo samples so every one tenth of a second a set of data points which is nothing else but 100 kilo samples of data gets brought from the hardware the usrb buffer towards the software and this process will iteratively continue the acquisition will keep happening a very classic example that we you know always use this is even true for data acquisition buffer data acquisition it's a very classic example we use that for um, um you know and getting this concept to be understood so what what do you need to understand is a a tap a bucket and a mug so you have a tap a water tap you open the water tap at a specific rate water will keep falling into the bucket so consider that to be like your data sampling rate your iq rate now the bucket it has a certain capacity you will keep you know it will keep filling now once in a while as you need water from the bucket you will use your cup the mug and take water from that towards where you want to use it so that part so whatever taps rate is that is iq rate this part which from where you you know take the data out that is this uh, samples that you will be defining as to number of samples you want to read from the uh, device onboard buffer okay so let's run through these one by one and this is how you would kind of set it onto the usrp uh, front panel, a program which you will be using USRP uh, drivers or USRP for. There will be the drivers, and on with the drivers, these are the these are the six parameters that we just mentioned as to what the as an answer to the question as to what the USRP is going to ask you. These are the six parameters. Starts with the device name, the IQ rate, the carrier frequency, the active antenna that you'll be using, the gain and the number of samples the fit size is another term okay so some of them are quite you know obvious so some of them are not so we will touch upon which the ones which are you know probably not that clear carrier frequency if someone is not clear this is just you know you have a signal which is at base baseband which is at zero hertz centered around zero hertz so you're bringing that from uh that particular band which is at zero hertz towards the carrier frequency so your uh, carrier frequency gets defined by the actual frequency you want to work uh, the signal in your iq rate essentially gets defined by the bandwidth um, of the signal that you're trying to work with so in case of usrps the rule is that the iq rate is, is it just needs to be comparable to the bandwidth <clears throat> the bandwidth all you need to consider is after you bring it to the baseband so you don't need to really consider the negative and positive frequencies if your signal bandwidth is uh, 1 megahertz it is from minus 500 kilohertz to plus 500 kilohertz so your signal is effectively band limited at 500 kilohertz and hence the iq rate of one mega mega samples per second would be uh, you know enough to sample this data by following the nyquist criteria gain is nothing else uh, but the power increase of the signal that you're trying to transmit but after you have received and the number of samples there are these equations that you can probably you know note down if needed wherein 
uh, how the fetch time, IQ rate, number of samples, samples, etc., are defined in terms of the time domain. Okay, so um, I'll not go into the the last part. The, I'll not go into the the hardware demonstration. That is uh, that's something that will be started tomorrow. What I can do now is I'll quickly um, take you through the drivers once, just to show you wh where they are and you know what they are like. Then that at that point the the sessions can be resumed tomorrow. Okay, so within this functions palette itself, okay, within this functions palette itself, I'll take five more minutes and then I'll we'll open for questions. Within this functions palette itself. We found out where the RF communications or modulation toolkits are. In a similar way, under instrument IO, once you have installed the USRP drivers, you would find the NI USRP palette. Okay. This is the receive set of functions that you see. So you have a, a particular chain. I mean, this is a set of functions that you will always end up using when you're programming USRPs, okay? So I'll just uh, try to, you know, explain this at a higher level first. And this again is not really exclusive to even USRP. So, this is a simple uh, instance of how a DACMX application process is, is done in LabVIEW. So data acquisition, how data acquisition happens in LabVIEW. The exact same process flow is used in USRP as well. You don't need to look at the functions below, but look at what is in the center. What do you do in the process flow is that you create a particular task. So certain parameters about the device that you're working with, some you know, additional information there would be taken in at the creation of the task. Once you create the task, there are some configurations that you need to do, which would involve almost all the tunability based parameters of the device. So the configuration of the task is done, following which the task is started. Then the continuous process of acquisition or generation of data happens, which is a iterative execution. It happens in a loop. And finally, it ends with clearing of that task. So the same is applicable here for the USRP as well. The first function, which is opening of the session, The next one is configuring of the signal. We have the initiation, we have the fetch, You have the stop, finally the closing of the session. Okay. So you can see what the purpose of each of these functions are. The first one just creates our kind of um,
kind of asks for the device name that you're trying to work with, some kind of a device identifier. Then you have the configuration function, which has a lot of functionality starting from the IQ rate, career frequency, the gain, the antenna that you're working with. So you, you notice the points here that whatever we are referring to right now, most of the tunable parameters would fall under this particular VI itself of configure signal. Following that, initiate. Board and the closing of the session. Look like this. This particular part would be looped for continuous execution. Okay. For example, here you see the various parameters. And this is the number of person, number of samples. So I'll create a control here. Create a control here. Okay, now you can notice that the various parameters that we are trying to control, you have the option to control them through these. Now, if you look back at the previously opened example of uh, the PSK, you'll get some perspective. You, you will get to know that these functions these functions are always absolutely necessary when you're working with the USRP. And these control the tunable parameters of the USRP, the RF front end. And over here, you have another block of code, another set of logic that you use to define what is the baseband signal that goes into the USRP. Okay. So this are the these are the two parts of the program that you typically see. And in, in any USRP based architecture, this would be repeated. And hence, you can always, uh, you know, <clears throat> hence, you can always define this uh, program from a template, you can start from a template rather than starting from the scratch. Probably tomorrow, your first exercise would involve this. But the point is that, and the first time you should probably build it from the scratch. But following that, this is something that you can probably work from a template itself. Okay. So uh, with that, I am coming to an end of the portion that I was trying to, or I had an intention of covering today. If you have any specific questions, we can uh, take them now. Okay, so participants, if you have any question, try, feel free to have a discussion, please. Professor King, any discussion from your side? Okay, so uh, let me start discussion from my side itself. So uh, again, I will be focusing more towards the hardware side. So uh, let's say, there is some kind of uh, error because of some sampling uh, after DAC and ADC. And again, uh, there is some error at hardware side that is with respect to the oscillator, with respect to the mixer. And that generates something called a uh, uh, problem uh, that is the synchronization problem. Now, in your opinion, practically, whatever you have observed, what are the important parameters which you consider or which you take care 
to maintain synchronization in between transmitter and receiver for real time analysis. Okay. So um, are you referring to any kind of impairments or just the actual when you're doing, let's say, packet transmission, the how you synchronize the packets? Yeah, just simply say, as of now, let's say some packet transmission, if we are doing from transmitter to receiver, and of course, with respect to time, we have to think of to maintain the ultra low latency kind of thing. Then uh, how to maintain and how to avoid that error? And what are the parameters which you in particular take care of? Okay. As far as hardware and their limitations, both are concerned. Okay. So the hardware as such, the USRP hardware as such, it it uh, it is a very uh, you know open radio platform. So you have the entire flexibility on this device. So uh, the moment you are thinking of let's say a, a packet transceiver that you're building, and and the the first part, okay, let me just take a step back. If you look at uh, any radio device, the point is that your radio devices. Uh, the synchronization is a problem that we have to approach separately, meaning we have to program it into the signals that we would want to, let's say, generate or receive. So in our case, if let's say a packet transceiver has to be built, this would be covered again in detail in the sessions, I think, day after. But uh, if a packet transceiver has to be built, the most important part in the packet you know, identification or synchronization as a sync sequence. I mean, over and above all the other factors of, uh, you know, codings that come into picture. Finally, what we would want to, uh, to uh, find out is to keep checking for a sync sequence within the entire data stream that keeps coming in and isolate the packets. So a packet, a typical data packet will have a structure like this, where you will have, um, you know, a guard band and some kind of uh, padding at the end as well. Within this, you have the core data and along with the data, there would be a sync sequence and packet number as well. So the first thing that you do, the moment you receive a signal, I mean, obviously a transmission, this thing is, this thing, this, this is quite easy. I mean, you are continuously generating the data set, you would keep uh, changing the packet number. Your sync sequence would remain the same and the receiver also will know what your synchronization sequence is going to be. Because in a communication system design, you don't know how the data is changing, but you can know how your packet structure is defined. I mean, the receiver needs to know how the transmitter packet structure is designed. So synchronization sequence that you have in the transmitter is something that the receiver is also very clearly aware of. So in that uh, perspective, what happens is at the receiver, it, your receiver uh, program, you have to design it in such a way that it keeps searching the received data stream for the synchronization sequence. And the moment the synchronization sequence, I mean, this is done through various techniques, correlation, uh, through various types of correlation, but finally you find out where the matching is to the best, you find, uh, the corresponding packet number. And then you know exactly at what bit after or half exactly after how many bits after the synchronization sequence your data starts. So you isolate those many bits along with the packet number and then take that to do the further processing or to really you know bring back the data set. So the synchronization really depends on the data itself, the digital data itself that you're generating or you're transmitting or the one that you're actually you know, querying or receiving. Uh, or now, multi uh, I will go to some other participants also. Uh, Mohammed Akram from Shanghai University. Any question from your side? Okay, so Astha is asking, is there any low cost uh, hardware solution or alternative to USRP for building projects on individual basis? Okay, so uh, see, I mean, this is this is a very, um, what do you say? 
this is exactly like the arduino kind of question i mean you have you always have options this is it's in an open market depending on the type of projects that you want to do there are always options so if you just do a quick googling itself you will be able to find out different you know different solutions at different price ranges and the, it's it's essentially a trade off that you're doing i mean to the amount of uh, features or applications that you can do and the amount that you're willing to pay they are there so all you need to do is just search for it you will you will get the option the simple platforms like digikey uh, you know elements 14 etc also has very low cost usrp sdr rather uh, rather than calling it usrp just search for sdr i mean that is the more generic or the common term that you can use for it search for sdr you will get a lot of options so mohammad dina any question from your side okay uh, looks like uh, uh, no okay so looks like there is no any further question for today so before ending let's have a discussion that uh, what will be the topics which we will be covering tomorrow so uh, amal uh, you can say or should i say i can i can bring it up so just just give me yeah. a second yes do please hello hello uh, nilim, you want nilim, to, nilim, I, please i uh, want to ask one question uh usrp is access a software defined radio transmitter and receiver so how much is the range between the transmitter and the receiver maximum range okay so this this is typically defined in power levels uh so the the actual usrp device it's it's the the transmitter and receiver it kind of are very close by but what we have seen in practical scenarios is even if you cable it out you cable it out and connect it to antennas within a large room you typically get the connectivity so that's what that's what i'm asking because i have done survey also and because the that distance is not uh, suitable for me a very less distance suppose now i wanted to have the quadcopter implement uh, quadcopter i wanted to implement this thing in the quadcopter and i want to take the navigation complete so this is not useful because i have seen the one video on it this uh, it this research program is there originally the, the usrp board they have they developed you uh, it is company they have shown one video that uh, they are used for the navigation purpose okay, okay. navigation means completely they are covering 1.2 km per area mm -hmm. so that's why i'm asking which board is uh, suitable for that no see ma'am the thing is uh, in in such an application also you would have so that is what i was telling sir also before that typically in an application like that uh mm -hmm. what we would have is some kind of uh, uh you know specifically some kind of amplifiers etc that would be required to improve the range of the device it's not an inherent capability of the device itself you would be using the same usrp amplifier you mean to say you want to have the e series and different n series or network series and e series you want to say like this way you need to replace the usrp board like there are 2690 different boards are there network series as well as the e series no, no, no. it's a little bit different nilima you can take like this way let's say yeah. if you have the e series and e series have its own power rating that is limited in terms of power let's say for example if it is okay. limited in in terms of power 5 db but so for, for aircraft uh, for aircraft let, navigation let, which board is suitable i'm asking let me complete so yeah. uh, if the power is limited by 5 db and then uh -huh. corresponding to that let's assume if the range is 500 meter now yeah. you want to enhance that range by let's say 2 km yeah. then you will have to enhance the power level first of all so what you can do you can take the rf front end that is a different power amplifier just connect it in the assembly line yeah. with that much power and ultimately the same previous usrp setup which has power 5 db power now it will be amplified from your uh, power amplifier whatever you will be connecting in the rf front end and now you can access up to even 2 km 4 km as well okay you mean to say you require the power booster okay yes. okay 
do we have any case study uh, i want to ask this question to the this uh, you are a third party dealer so what are the applications uh, you have done with this us rp code case study do we have the case study with the us rp code so case study is uh, carry on carry on yeah yeah so the case studies i actually have have this in this presentation but you know due to uh, this being a time limited session we have not really i didn't really go through it but there are a lot of applications that you typically see for a usrp device i mean start one of them being uh, the research applications you start with various domains within uh, communications research so you start with mimo that is one you know large area case study then cognitive radio is another one full duplex communication is another one um then no, no, you... i'm asking you the the application you have any you are you have you developed any applications like 5g or any things you have developed for some industry or some commercial purpose have you done anything for the commercial we as in uh, our company is it yeah okay so our company is actually uh, we have used we have uh, developed these frameworks so so we are a solution provider we are a partner to national instruments what we have done is we have developed these frameworks for the applications like ciso systems or its packet transceiver systems or noftm based system or uh, we have developed a mimo system as well see when you say have you developed a 5g the point is that at the end of the day you know a lot of people are working on different aspects of the final system as we see it so what we are doing one part of it at least is is in this line of uh, you know developing and giving people who are working on these frameworks that can be used to develop these end end to end systems another project that we are working on is again it's it's a defense project but you know just a, a part of it i can probably uh, uh, discuss here which is essentially a new type of antenna again so the new type of antenna it requires a very uh, you know uh, custom uh, type of waveform customized type of waveform the modulation scheme itself is customized so you have we used the usrp as a backend for that so to implement the physical layer for that and in fact that is where you know i can connect to your application as well we actually had designed an amplifier as well in between because the antenna it required a very high power it was for long distance transmission purpose so we designed a power amplifier a 10 watt power amplifier for high distance transmission uh from the usrp so the usrp which is the 2901 which is i think uh, the n210 the it is version yeah, yeah so we at it is board we had designed a power amplifier I mean, so this is for a specific uh, defense application. So I can't mo go more into the same. We actually are working on this product. We have received a government grant. We are working on this product now, but because of the nature of the project itself, I can't go into more details. But to if I see, uh, okay, uh, if I see, I, I can understand the problem. Uh, if I see the inside of the processor, which is a Spartan six, now nobody, nobody is using Spartan six. Why you are not upgrading it to be a, a higher version? uh ma'am so the usrp rios that are there so it, it really depends on the design of the device the newer version of that are coming coming out the kintex usr the the usrp rios for example they use kintex fpgas so that's a device uh, or the oem level problem because any device design that you do they there are some business critical decisions also that they have to take with respect to it so the newer usrp rios they have kintex 7 fpgas and i think um, even the deployable ones the tune and sandforce they have advanced new new generation fpg reports the older ones that's yeah it's still there it's the same last thing in the last 10 years same uh, board is there spartan 6 and nobody is using in the company spartan 6 right now okay thank you so much thank you so <clears throat> in the end uh, just we will have discussion that what we will be doing tomorrow so amal just go ahead yeah yeah so this is the agenda for tomorrow uh, what what we have covered till now is the lab view and the usrp hardware architecture just to uh, you know there will be some overlap with whatever content is there tomorrow so the last part that i covered as to how the usrp uh, uh, you know tunable parameters can be controlled using the usrp drivers so my colleague shubham is uh, handling the sessions tomorrow so we'll start from there we'll go to the usrp uh, uh, 
interfacing of the USRP drivers with the other other uh, software components. And uh, we tomorrow that part of the session, the first part of the session will uh, involve some demonstrations, simple uh, simple uh, demonstrations of uh, sine wave transmission. Uh, then we will touch upon the different modulation techniques. So there you will visit the modulation toolkit in detail. You'll understand how uh, each or different, uh, uh, I think one example from each probably might be covered of uh, analog modulation, uh, probably an FM signal demodulation is there in the agenda. And one of the digital modulation signal is, uh, will be covered. And uh, in the second part, you will actually be, uh, I think, probably developing a, a program and uh, the same would be demonstrated at our side of uh, receiving of an FM signal over their FM signal. So again, very exciting session for today, uh, to tomorrow also, uh, as far as uh, today's session also. So uh, in the end, uh, let me thank you first of all, Amal, for such exciting and such great session with discussion with all the participants. And again, uh, we will be meeting on the same platform using the same link on the same time or having our second date session. Uh, today's uh, video will be available just after some time on our YouTube channel also. We will send the link maybe after a few hours. And uh, those of you who have doubt and uh, the participants, those of you who have the doubt, any kind of doubt, either it is related to uh, installation or related to the basic level programming which we did today just to go there have a see have a link from that just to go through that and try to practice at your home as well so that you can get more and more benefited from this particular workshop so that's all from our side for today so thank you by uh, for thank you for attending our session and uh, now the time is to say goodbye for today so goodbye all of you thank you for attending today's session Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good evening.